our workshop. Um, anybody who might be watching, welcome. And I know there's a few people here today that uh, just want to welcome you to our meeting. Um, and again, a reminder that today is a workshop so that um, there will be um, three or four items that we discuss and only one item will there be public input. And that's because it's a uh, uh, the, the item's already been funded, it's already been voted on, it's just a matter of deciding um, uh, one direction or another. Um, so we will uh, allow public input on that item. Um, before we get started, um, Commissioner Seal, uh, bless her heart, she's gotten over her, her cold, but she's had some minor surgery and she's at home, and but is healthy enough to participate. And so, as we did last time, we need to um, make a legislative decision here to allow her to participate. And so that's where we're at. So I need either conversation or a motion for that. I move that we allow Commissioner Steele to participate. Okay. Second from oh, Commissioner Flowers. Did you get that? Okay. Uh, Don, did you have any other comments that you wanted to make? Uh, no, no, Commissioner, only other that you should take public comment on right. this since you're going to vote on it. But other than that, no, uh, okay. it is a legislative determination. Thank you. Okay, we will be taking public comment on whether to allow Karen to join us this morning. Um, and do we have anybody in the room? I don't have any cards here for that, so there's anybody online that would Great. be. At this time, if there are any members of the public appearing uh, virtually who wish to comment on Commissioner Seal's appearance virtually in this meeting, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, we do have one individual who raised their hand. Um, this particular individual is coming in from the phone line, last four digits, 6368. Uh, Ma'am or sir, when you are unmuted, if you could please state and spell your name for the record and state your address, you will have three minutes. Thank you. Is this, are you speaking to Kathleen? Ex I have no objection to Ms. Steele joining. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sorry. Okay, all right, nobody else? No, Mr. Okay. Chair. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries uh, unanimously. Karen, you are welcome to join us this morning uh, and participate in the meeting. Um, before we get started with the agenda uh, today, we'll go ahead and turn it to, over to Barry just to give us a little update on um, the crazy world of vaccine distribution. Um, give us an update, Barry. This morning I asked Dr. Cho to join us um, to provide just a brief update regarding the ever-moving um, world of vaccine distribution. And so um, if Dr. Cho would come up, he can just uh, provide some opening comments. I'll have some um, clarifications and additions for people. So. Um, and then we'll, you know, just uh, answer any questions. Okay. Thank you again, Dr. Cho, for being here this morning. My Appreciate pleasure. it. Good morning, everybody. Um, okay. So vaccines. Um, starting off with um, some of the work to date. I, I think, uh, given some of the challenges, some of the issues, is we don't want to lose sight of the work that has been conducted, some of the successes. <laughs> So I'd like to start with that. Um, in terms of the number of individuals vaccinated, um, it's over 84,000 here in Pinellas County through collective efforts. That translates to 8.6% of our population vaccinated. Um, uh, given that number, it's we're number three uh, in the percent population that's been vaccinated among the seven largest counties here in Florida. We're number two in the state in terms of the long-term care residents and staff that have been vaccinated just behind Miami-Dade. And that is an important point given the uh, disproportionate burden of uh, disease in those long-term care facilities. 61% of the deaths have come from them. Um, the fire paramedics are doing a spectacular job at our community um, sites uh, with over 10,000 uh, administered a week. Um, and we all recognize that this process is complex. We know there's been some good work done locally, uh, and we, we all want the same thing. We're all achieving for that same goal of getting the shots in the arms as safely and as quickly as possible. So in that context, uh, we're focusing on three key areas, um, distribution, access, and communication. So f uh, starting with the distribution, uh, our primary focus right now has been these community pods, just given the numbers that they've been able to do both daily and weekly. 
Um, we're currently looking for a larger site, and I think some of the advantage, advantage of that is that um, you can expand and contract as needed as vaccines become available. You could also uh, do both the first and doses, uh, second doses simultaneously. Keep in mind the two dose, um, two vaccines available currently does require the, the two doses. Um, and then uh, hopefully in the next uh, two or three weeks, we may actually have other vaccines available. Johnson & Johnson, uh, will, I suspect, will apply for an EUA in the next two to three weeks as well, which is one dose. Uh, uh, sticking with the distribution plan, we also are continuing to look for other access points. You need to try to uh, increase the access in the community, both geographically, so people do have that access. And to that end, uh, we're working with pharmacy partners. So you saw that uh, we've expanded here in Publix, 42 stores, uh, 4,200 uh, to be uh, vaccinated starting, I believe, today. Uh, beyond that, too, uh, the, the, at the federal level, they've started a federal pharmacy partnership. And for Florida, that means potentially Publix, um, Walmart, and Winn-Dixie. Um, in terms of the details as to which counties, which stores, so that has not been released at this time. And certainly we'll share with the board when, when that is available. Beyond that, too, I think it's, continue, it's important to continue to look at other avenues of distribution. Uh, because if we are to get a larger than expected uh, vaccine, our sites get inundated with the second doses. So that, that means working with other partners that can also distribute the medication, such as the hospitals. Uh, they'll continue as vaccines become available to them, uh, continue to vaccinate their healthcare workers, the 65 plus within their networks, even healthcare workers outside of their network. We're also looking at um, our senior centers, our senior community centers, um, targeting again the 65 plus. Um, and for next week, I believe, uh, there's four community sites that were selected um, with a, a total of 2,600 vaccines to be administered at Briar Creek on top of the world, Gall, Aid, and Town Shores. These were selected via um, a survey conducted by the emergency management team looking at interest, demand, looking at geography, income, diversity. So uh, that, in a nutshell, looking, uh, continue to look for other avenues, working with pharmacies is, is the, the, the focus in terms of the distribution. Now moving on to access. Um, access is largely, especially since we're using online portals, is, um, is, is something that we're continuing to try to improve upon. Uh, we're working with a vendor, CDR Health, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and though we were able to get the 10,000 uh, appointments within 45 minutes, I believe, there was some technical issues and some concerns. We have worked with them in the past week now to try to develop and change that rather than um, everyone coming up at once to, to, to get registered, working on some sort of waiting list. So we're working in, uh, along that line. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of health equity, uh, that's a huge concern in terms of access as well. Um, if you look at our county report, um, you can see that of those vaccinated, only 4.5% were African American and 5% were Latinx of the known race and ethnicity. So certainly there is that disparity issues as well. And, and uh, to tackle that in, involves information education, um, looking at the data, sharing that data with the community, uh, going over the sciences, the safety and efficacy of the vaccines, um, and to that end, uh, the one community uh, group is hosting a panel discussion tonight at um, six o'clock. It's going to be online. Uh, I'm part of that panel along with some community partners. Um, and then access, working with faith-based organizations, organizations that serve community of color to best um, administer the vaccine most effectively. And then lastly, and uh, just from what you gather, what I've presented here, there's a lot of stuff going on, obviously. It's complex, a lot of balls in the air. So I think one of our roles is to make sure that that is communicated as efficiently and appropriately as possible. I know our, our, our uh, communication teams working with the county, working with jurisdictions, their PIOs are, are meeting almost daily to try to get that information out there, to share that information. Uh, we're trying to uh, I know Barbara and her team are doing a great job keeping that uh, vaccine page as updated as we can. So we'll try to make that the one-stop shop. Uh, but again, it, uh, we'll work uh, collaborative and continue to do so to get that information out there. So with that, I'll stop there and take any questions. I can just highlight a couple pieces, though, that I just, you know, Dr. Cho said them, but I, I, I want to repeat the, we understand people's frustration. You know, you, you go in at 3 o'clock and the website, you get a spinning wheel. And, and it doesn't tell you where you're at. And we've been working, AC McGuire is one of the largest um, suppliers of, of a system that's out there. We had to stand something up quickly. Originally, it was, it was thought that the pharmacies and the doctor groups would be administering this, and it quickly changed. 
Um, we stood that up, and they're continuing to work to refine it. For there are 90% of the people coming in, and I'm, that's a round number, but it's a significant portion. They're not going to receive a vaccine because supply is not there. We had 10,000. We have 200,000 200, people trying to get those slots. So the majority of people are going to be stuck with a spinning wheel. Um, we know that's an insufficient system. They've been, had, our team's been working with H.D. McGuire in terms of if you register, they reach back out to you and give you a time period in which to schedule a slot. Um, so the registration system is probably the biggest complaint we've heard. We have heard you. Uh, we understand that, and we're working to make sure that actually works before we would offer something like that up. Um, the publics, you know, that's a state contract. Um, that, that was always in the mix. Um, they, their system seems to be working, but it's the same type of concept. They run that in three states. They won't change that in, in terms of the way in which they do it um, because it's a, it's a multi-state uh, system that they're running. Um, the, health the health equity piece is a big deal. Dr. Cho's working, and he needs to expand that out, and they're going to be doing that to where you can do these special missions. That's how you see things pop up in, 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 in communities or in a senior center or things like that. But, uh, but all those are predicated on supply because we've received a lot of requests to, okay, have it here, have it here. Well, the, you know, there's not the capacity for us to be able to do that. Uh, nor the supply to be able to, to do that everywhere until those two things increase. And so that's the balancing act that, that we're challenged with. Um, and, you know, and I think you'll, and there's been some good ideas and we're following through on a lot of those ideas, but some of that's just going to take time and, and an increase in supply. So um, I, I only mention a few of these because these are the things we've heard repeatedly from folks and I want to know that you know, we are listening. Um, it's just you know, we have to navigate a state system, a federal system, a supply side, and, and contracts that are at a higher level um, to be able to determine how we fit and best serve, you know, our residents from locally. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, I have a few questions. The 84,000, are those 84,000 individuals that got the first dose? Yeah, at least one dose. At least one dose. But some of those might be people who've gotten both doses? Yes. Um, yes, it is. I can present you that information okay. as well. Um, the, uh, so we have the, the portal that we set up, hmm. that the doses that we received to the State Department of Health local office. Then there's a state site that they set up <laughs> last week to, yes. for people to register. And then there's the public's registration <laughs> correct and then we're going to get a federal registration potentially i don't we I don't know, know yet what that will be so it's just that's where it's going to get even more confusing for folks mm -hmm. you know are they supposed to sign up on all four and hope that you know they get into what it's that that's where we're hearing the the complaint i did want to ask if, if i can it, if i can address that sure. because i don't want to lose sight of that because people say why didn't you join the state system until last friday we did not know there was a state system there was no communication with us locally, not in any of the counties, and that's the reason none of the counties have joined it. We didn't know anything about it. And so how are we supposed to tie into a system? And remember, like the H.D. McGuire, not only do you register it and it has all that information, it assigns a slot that manages your vaccine distribution and it has a check-in process at the site. So we're working with the state to figure out their, that capability, how it could tie in. But until last Friday, you know, again, that so you can't just sign up to a system. Just having a registration system doesn't do it. It's got to tie in to the way in which you allocate your vaccine slots. Well, that was that was a good question because it was in one of the news stories, and we got some emails saying why did Pinellas opt out of the state system? And I said, well, we haven't opted out of anything. We have just haven't opted in. I guess we don't know, <laughs> you know, necessarily. But I, you know, it's important for folks to know at home that we're we're taking every bit of help that we can get. We're you not bet. opting out of anything. And then uh, since I have the mic, just uh, say that because we got a few emails and this is how social media and information flows is the commissioners did not receive vaccines ahead of anybody else um, unless I was left out of a group meeting that I didn't know about. But <laughs> the commissioners have not received vaccines ahead of anybody else. I just wanted to say that since some, some of the information that's flowing around. Commissioner Long. Yes. <clears throat> and I understand that there's a lot of moving parts, Barry, and that it's a very complicated issue in terms of trying to get 
250,000 people vaccinated all at once. What is really uh, amazing and staggering to me is the fact that so many folks are getting, trying to get on. They do get on. They type in information. And come on, it's 2021. You would think the system would have the capability of capturing that and putting it in a queue right. so that they're in there and they can be confident that they are in a queue, but it doesn't even appear to let you do that. And I find that totally unacceptable. We've been doing this now for weeks. Um, and unless I have totally missed something, we're not making that much progress on this part of it, and that is what is so frustrating to people. Well, we so we did make progress because it did not crash. Well, and that's kind of a low bar to set. I, I grant you that. It, it did allow for the 10,000 slots. There, but it was supposed to, they were working on having it to where it could tell you you're, you know, 9,999, and so stay in here and you're gonna be able to get a slot or you're, you know, you know, 90,000 and you're not gonna receive one of the slots, but it, but it didn't have that capability. Um, that's the reason we had to shift that to just simply a registration and a way to reach back out to them and give them an opportunity. Um, so they're, they're, they were working on it. There were also people that got into and scheduled a first shot, but then when they went to go to the second shot, it kicked them out. The company is contacting each and every one of those individuals and making sure they have that second shot. Um, so there, it, it, there, it absolutely is a work in progress. Um, this is one of the biggest companies out there. That's the reason a lot of the counties you know, went to them. Um, but it, obviously it is not performed to the level that we expect. Well, did and they give you any idea at all how long it's gonna be before people can actually get their name in there and there'll be a, some sort of a queue? Well, I, I, I mean, think- it can't just go on forever and ever. Well, they, they, they're telling us they're capable of doing that now. The question is, is when do we're gonna stand that up? Remember, so our fire paramedics at our four pod sites right now, they're gonna start doing second doses next week. So we have a capacity issue even within us to be able to, di to distribute. Right. We're, we're looking, if we get new vaccine for first doses, we gotta find a different distribution method because our fire, fire, fire paramedics are busy doing second doses for the next three weeks. So we've got a little time to work on this and uh, while the public's and then we're doing their first shots and then we're doing these special missions. But, but you're, to your point, they are saying that right now we, we can push out that you register out of our site, out of our site on the C.D. McGuire site, and then they will pull and give you a time in which to register, and so you'll go directly to a, a slot. And that's what we're working on, which is what people have been asking for. Um, what, we, what has been promised and under-delivered by the company, we made very clear to them, and, and in fact said, if this isn't fixed, then you know we're moving to somewhere else because this is unacceptable. Um, I hear your frustration. You should be frustrated, and because our residents are, and I and I completely understand that, and and ag completely agree that the performance of the system has not been up to par. Um, Dr. Cho, I think uh, Commissioner Justice asked a question that basically took that 8.6 percent number that you gave us and probably made it less because we. I think it's important for us to know how many people are getting vaccine, vaccinated as opposed to how many vaccines have we given out? I mean, I, I don't know that that represents 8.6%. No, 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 that, that was individuals, so that at least got one dose. Say so, that again? So uh, 84,000 is uh, uh, individuals that at least got one dose of the vaccine. I know, but I want okay. first dose, not necessarily at least one dose, because we could be into that second doses and that number is only 50,000 first. Okay. You know, I just want to have a, a sense of where we are on that. No and then if we could get that same information for the 65 plus, you, you said that was everybody, but I'm assuming that that's that there's a breakdown uh, of um, those that are over 60 because that's that first target zone. Is right. that 65 plus? It's 65. Um, and, the and healthcare medical. workers and long term care residents and staff. And, uh, so, yeah, so, so, so if we, of the 84,000, a little over 50,000 is 65 plus. Okay. And again, back to that first second right. dose thing that would be helpful. Um, and then the, just um, I saw the uh, governor's order yesterday on uh, that there is an avenue for folks 
that have an underlying condition okay. to get vaccinated. And if you could just speak to that as it relates to the hospitals, I think. But if you could just speak to that real quick. Okay. Um, so there was a, the, the executive order um, does have this one section um, that uh, for those under 65, those with uh, a severe um, health condition as deemed by a hospital uh, provider. Um, so a lot of it is going to be inpatient when they're in the hospital, um, but that's really uh, into the into the responsibility and purview of the hospitals. Um, a few of the hospitals got a very small amount, um, hundreds, uh, to start potentially that that subgroup. It's, I understand. I just want to make sure that if folks have that kind of condition, they, they've asked us, well, they should be on the list too, right. and they could possibly be on a list if, if like a primary provider through the hospital system a baycare doctor, for instance, if you, or, or whoever, right. if you happen to be a patient there and you have rationale. I, I just want to make sure that people understand that there is that avenue. It, doesn't, it didn't say anything about you have to be in the hospital to get right. it. It just says you're going to have to get it through the hospital system. And I just want to make sure for clarification. And, and the selection process, the, the exclusion criteria are developed by the hospitals. And I suspect that they may all have a little variation depending on which hospital system um, is administering to that population. But the governor did allow for that option. I right. just wanted, okay. Um, the, um, you know, again, I think we've said it a couple times. This is a complex system. And distribution of this is just, it's a work in progress. And I, you know, to the extent that um, I think we would all hope for a little better communication mm -hmm. uh, from um, the state to help us anticipate the next week's activity. I mean, trying to figure out the best system is a work. I, I would imagine that if we were set in stone the first week that we would have missed opportunities on how to get this vaccine out. So you're gonna have to, we, we as a state or we as an area are gonna have to be flexible to develop new ways to, to, to distribute. And, and whether it's the hospitals or the drug stores or the grocery store uh, pharmacies or us, I mean, it's, I, I don't think that we're at the final solution yet, and probably over the next couple of months, we're still going to be developing that, which is, again, why I just want to get a, a, a running total of how many of those 65 and over we've hit, because it's after that that we've got to start addressing the rest of the population. So. And, and those contracts are managed at the state level and in now possibly even at the federal level. So when, when somebody says, why didn't you go to Publix before this, we couldn't. Publix wouldn't contract with us unless it was approved by the state. That was when I had to leave the meeting. The other was trying to get the state to move on that. And then at the same time, you have a rollout of a federal program that then increased that. And so then the state was, I mean, it, it, it really is a work in progress. And, yeah. and those distribution channels are, are building themselves out. Um, part of that is just supply, um, but it's also uh, some of these contracts. Well, and I, you know, and I, you know improving our system, Barry, um, you know, again, a couple of days ago, we correct. weren't even sure that we were going to have a role that's going correct. forward except these second doses, and that's still developing. So we could end up yes. having a first dose role further defined, and if we're going to do that and we're going to have a system, I'm glad to hear that we're working on tweaking that system because it's t it, 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 it invited, here's what it invited. It invited 100,000 people to call in mm -hmm. at once. But those 100,000 people, each of them probably had two or three mechanisms that they were using mm -hmm. to call in on because they were like, well, I've got to try. I've got to try multiple ways yep. to get my mom or my grandmother registered. And it just overwhelmed. It, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're working on that improved system. Yep. And I hope working on is we, like we're going to get that done. No. We have, um, Lourdes has nightly calls, well, Lourdes and team, <laughs> they have nightly calls um, with, the, with the company. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is absolutely, uh, and it wasn't like we didn't foresee this. We asked for that type of registration process from the very beginning. Yeah. Okay, so we wanted to, to get there. It's the company's capabilities of building that out. And so, yes, we've been assured that that, but, you know, I'd like to see it tested too before, before we launch something and, you know, find that it doesn't work. So. Yeah. Um, we want to make we want to make sure we have a little time to be able to build to work on that. But yes, the intent is that we would not have you know a three o'clock. Everybody has to rush to try to get the few slots that are available. And I'm glad we talked about access. I mean, because it's not only 
um, folks that are older that don't know how to get on the system, right, that yes. we're trying to figure out ways to do it. I was in a mayor's council meeting yesterday, and they, they threw out some other ideas, like putting those phone numbers in our utility bills and such, that folks that don't get on the computer might have a better understanding and a direct route. That, I mean, yeah. So I just hope we're continuing it, to explore how to access those folks. We, we're also. absolutely keeping continuing to work on all the different channels okay. we discussed. And to that point, uh, access is a huge issue if you're not computer literate, right. um, you know, or quick on the your fingers, you know. Um, well, this way, if it's a registration system and they call you back, well, then you could call in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday and get registered walking through the questions right. uh, at their phone bank. Well, that right. takes forever. You can't do that and try to grab a slot, but you could do that ahead of time, be registered, to where then we reach out to you in a random fashion. Yeah. So, so I just want to make sure we're exploring all of those. We are. You know, folks, places like Top of the World have a way that they can even scroll information to their residents on their TVs in their place. And so I'm, not, I'm just taking that as an example that you could get information out that way also. So I just want to make sure that we're exploring everything. And to the, the issue on, on equity in our community, I think, from an educational standpoint, it would be helpful to make sure our residents understand that African Americans make up probably 13 to 15 percent, whatever that number is of our population, and right now they're earning at four and a half percent. So it clearly shows that we have a problem. And I want to make sure that everybody understands that issue. And it's it also with the Latino community. Um, I don't know what percentage of the population, seven, eight percent, and they're at what did you say, three percent? And so I think our residents need to understand that, that that's a part of our, of our, of our distribution plan and, um, and we should work really, diff uh, obviously, overtime for access issues. Um, and I think that's all I had. Does anybody else have any comments or questions for Dr. Cho? Yes. Since you're, thank you, Mr. Chair. Since you're talking about the access, the, some of the emails that we've been receiving are, or how are we reaching into some of those apartment buildings or communities that, you know, um, are kind of term isolated or, you know, how are we doing that? And I know it's still early in the process. Mm -hmm. And I mean, my hope would be that that the, the federal and the state program gets so uh, robust at Publix and Walmart and those that then we can kind of come in and fill in on some of those communities that they're right. not going to know about or have access to. But are we are we at the point where we're taking proactive steps in some of those communities that we talked about in, in previous meetings? As an update, too, for the state, um, so currently they're using a vendor to finish, uh, at least statewide, the um, ALFs and uh, the nursing homes. Um, uh, last I read in just a few days ago now, it was about 88% complete, completed. Um, the, um, uh, the, 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 what they mentioned on a state call is that once they're done and completed that mission, they are contemplating and considering moving to uh, in independent living facilities, adult daycare, as well as home health. So utilizing some of that, and, and uh, I'll keep you posted on those plans as well. And someone mentioned, um, and again, I don't know exactly what we've, but someone in our, one of the emails mentioned uh, using the communication contact list that we have for emergency evacuations for folks that need extra help using some of those kind of uh, lists of folks. So anyway, I thought it was a, a worthwhile thing at least to look at, so. We have a, we have a lot of people to reach, you know, and, sure. and limited supply, and so it's trying to pull off. We get 10,000 doses, so we're, what are we pulling, 9,000 to be in the, the regular call and 1,000 to start, but then that's 1,000 at a time, and it's, And yeah. you know, I, I understand <laughs> that. Some of these emails we get are, are simply complaining, and some of them are, are okay, well, that's a pretty yeah, good idea, right. and I just want to try and make sure that I don't forget to share it with you as well. And, and you know, Dr. Chan, Cho has a um, vaccine, you know, priority uh, plan, and, and that's where we're trying to keep in mind, and then it'll, it'll fluctuate and change as, the, as these distribution channels kind of build out, um, but it's creating that balance to where we don't, you know, forget different groups. It just, just this next um, Monday and Tuesday, we're trying to do, continue to do healthcare workers. So we're talking about 65, but we haven't even reached some of our frontline healthcare workers, our our, our um, medical staff over in the jail. I mean, these these are folks that are in that very first group, and we need to make sure we reach all of them. And we're we're still not to everyone there yet, so it is absolutely a work in progress. Yeah, I think that obviously the 65 plus age group is a very diverse group. Um, you know, folks that are 65 and 70. 
versus folks that are 90 and 95, and we don't. We want to try to minimize those gaps uh, as much as possible. Um, do you have any update on that one long-term care facility that we had heard about earlier in the week? Uh, I, I, I guess I didn't send it to everybody, but yes, they actually visited about two days ago and administered close to 50 vaccines to staff and residents, and the, the ones that reached out to you. And is there, was there any overriding issues that... Uh, well, uh, um, Unfortunately, how did they draw? How did they fall between the cracks in this? So, unfortunately, uh, some of the facilities that uh, do, do have some of the outbreaks. One of the exclusion criteria for getting vaccines is that you can't be actively infected. Uh, so, it would, if it, if there's too much in a given facility, uh, they wouldn't be able to vaccinate um, everybody. Um, uh, and, and even for those on quarantine, so there are some uh, recommendations to uh, be mindful and, and to wait for that quarantine period to be over. So, I think th those were some of the elements and factors that contributed there. Okay, what, and I just read something about, um, uh, again, numbers that I'm not familiar with, but um, the folks that are actually working in the long-term care facilities, there seems to be an, a, a disproportionately low number of employees that are getting vaccinated. To me, which presents that conduit from the outside to our long-term care facilities. So I'm not quite sure I understand the options that are available to workers that work in long-term care facilities, but. Maybe you could speak to that. Sure. I think it speaks to the larger vaccine hesitancy. There's been surveys through a number of healthcare workers that does show that something consistent to what we're seeing here. In terms of healthcare workers, only about a third was willing to, and keep in mind this is voluntary, is uh, one third uh, was willing to take the vaccine. But similarly, if you look at a lot of frontline, um, in terms of um, healthcare surveys, it, it, it's consistent. I believe there was, a, at least a few months ago, an um, American Nurses Association survey that was conducted where it was one third of the nurses would take it, one third was unsure, and one third uh, would not take it. So it, it, I think it goes back to some of those he hesitancy concerns <laughs> and, and uh, keeping in mind and understanding that uh, the vaccine is relatively new. And uh, um, I, I do stand by the safety and efficacy of it, um, but, um, but again, it's, it's, it, the first one was approved just two months ago. Okay, well, that certainly continues to be a concern then, our, 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 our long-term care facilities that you know, obviously, we're trying to do what we can to protect them. To, but to combat that, so I think if I had to guess, looking at them, what, what I know of the numbers, in terms of our staff, it's a little over a third of the, the long-term care facilities. But if you look at the residents, it's probably about 75% mm -hmm. or more, um, even closer to 80%. That's, that's good news. So. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Cho, for being here again. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll stay We have a Facebook Live we, on Friday. Yeah. I was okay. going to mention that we are doing a Facebook Live on Friday, Dr. Cho. Uh, Barry and myself, uh, and because things were moving so fast that we thought it would be important to, to, to get out and talk to folks where we are at the end of the week and what to expect next week, right. and then what we're kind of looking at long term. So, and we may be doing that kind of on a regular basis. So. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are going to go to our first item on the agenda. Uh, Barry, if you'll go ahead and uh, Get us started. So uh, the next item on the agenda is the North Loop Trail. As you recall, um, we, we were back here, here talking actually in a different location, but um, talking about two different options. Um, you had asked for or you had made a decision subject to staff's review. They've been working and getting feedback in the community and kind of evaluating the two different options for the north port portion of that. Ken Jacobs is here. He's going to provide um, an overview of the work that they've done and the options, um, and then seek your guidance in terms of uh, where we um, can go with finalizing this project. Welcome, Ken. Thank you for having me here. I uh, want to go ahead and uh, start the presentation, uh, give you an update on what we've done and, and how we got here, and, and uh, give you a, a summary of, of what we found out from the public. Uh, Pinellas Trail uh, Loop is uh, something that's been on the books since the 80s and 90s, and it was envisioned as a continuous 75-mile uh, multi-use uh, path for uh, recreation, transportation. And uh, I'm going to use a lot of, of the laser pointer today if it, if it helps. Uh, the blue line that you see here, that's the entire loop structure. Uh, there's a missing segment right down here that we're working on. For the most part, everything else has been completed. What you see in the black square right there is 
uh, the project that we call the North Loop Trail Project. Uh, it, it, uh, on the inset, you can see it goes from John Chestnut Park on the north side down to Enterprise on the south side. Uh, as, as part of that, it's about 6.8 miles. It's currently under construction, except for the segment in the orange square that you see in the inset, which is uh, right here. And that's the, the topic of discussion today. Um, these are the, the meetings that we've done. Uh, for the most part, uh, the November 18 meeting was the first public meeting, uh, included uh, the entire uh, North Loop project. Uh, from that, we, we got a lot of comments, we addressed a lot of comments, we made changes to the plans. Um, relative to the, all these meetings, we did send a uh, handout uh, as part of the agenda packet that, that kind of goes over what was talked about at each one of the meetings and um, kind of what was uh, the topic of the meeting because they, they vary in, in terms of the meetings. Uh, the first one included the entire thing, but it, uh, as, as part of the preliminary design, the concept was to use uh, the Duke Energy Trail as much as, uh, Duke Energy easement as much as possible. Um, in April of 2019, uh, we went to the board with a status meeting, uh, talking about the information that we collected uh, during the first meeting. Uh, there was, uh, residents that were concerned about using the uh, Duke Energy Trail. And so we, uh, the board asked for a workshop. In June of 19, we had that workshop. Uh, the key element that came out of that workshop was uh, a request by the board to uh, use Northside Drive instead of, Northside Drive and Countryside Boulevard instead of going down the Duke Energy easement. So the next two meetings, we're really focused on that Northside Drive alignment. And so in October of 19, we, we went out and discussed with the residents uh, the Northside Drive countryside alignment. Uh, from that, we got 123 comments. Uh, 45 of those comments were specifically saying that they believed that the original alignment down the Duke Energy easement was the safest and better way to go. Uh, because of that, it, it, it put, put us in an issue where, uh, well, let me go back. In June of 19, we were told, go down Northside Drive unless, unless a problem develops. Uh, because of the, the uh, issue with the public's concerns, we felt like that was enough of a problem to where we needed to come back to the board. Uh, in December of 2020, before we came back, we wanted to go ahead and, and do a, a larger public meeting that included all the people on either alignment to get a consolidated set of comments that we could bring back to the board. Um, after all that was done, uh, as, as part of those, just to bring you up to speed on the two alignments, alignment A, this is... Uh, uh, this is the Duke Energy easement. Uh, this is currently being constructed. Right now it stops at Northside and, uh, and the Duke Energy easement. So the original alignment, or alignment A, is the yellow line. And it goes down the energy easement, across up, goes to Meadowood Drive, and then it would cross Meadowood Drive on the north side and go over to Countryside Boulevard. This segment of the trail is also under construction. Uh, these alignment B, which is what was discussed at the June 19 meeting, was uh, stop here, go down Northside Drive, cross over to the east side of Countryside Boulevard, and then go up and meet the, the uh, construction that's ongoing at Meadowwood. So those are the two alignments. Um, what we, what we came back with at, at the December 20th meeting was uh, we pulled together a lot of, of uh, data about the two different alignments so we could compare uh, the pros and cons to each one so we could provide that information to the public. Uh, these are some of the, the items that we came up with relative to the comparisons. Uh, a couple of key, uh, key factors that, that we looked at was 
Along alignment A, uh, Meadowwood specifically, the speed limit is, is 25. Uh, it's a higher speed limit on Northside Drive and Countryside Boulevard at 35 miles an hour. The volumes on, uh, on Meadowwood uh, is only 336 vehicles per day, and on Northside Drive, it's 3,600 vehicles per day. Uh, the crashes was uh, along this alignment uh, was five over the last three years, and this alignment was 15 over the last four years. Uh, another concern that uh, was voiced by the citizens was how many times are you crossing side streets? Because every time you cross a side street with a trail, uh, you have potential conflicts between the vehicles and the trail users. So on, on alignment A, there's, there's six crossings, and alignment B, there would be nine crossings. So all these uh, little crossings right here uh, add up to nine as you, as you go down Northside Drive and Countryside. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the Duke Energy easement isn't uh, a, uh, you know, the, the most... Uh, scenic uh, way for the trail to grow to go uh, we don't disagree it's it's basically open space uh, the other alignment does have uh, probably a better view it's got golf courses ponds things like that uh, one of the the items that we did note is up here at this intersection uh, there is a little bit of a limited sight distance as you see as you come southbound you're in this curve uh, so if to make sure that that was a safe crossing, uh, we realized that we would have to put some kind of advanced flashers out there to make sure that, that, uh, that the crossings would be safe. Uh, along each alignment where it crosses uh, one of the major roads, either at Northside Drive right here or Meadowwood right here, uh, we would have some sort of uh, Originally, we were talking about uh, rapid uh, rectangular flashing beacons, or RRFBs. Uh, in the case of uh, Meadowwood, we would probably put an advanced flasher north and south of there just to make sure that vehicles were aware that there was a, a trail user using the crossing. Uh, cost uh, comparison at the time uh, is uh, about 700000 for this alignment and about a million for this alignment, although that's an estimate because we don't have a detailed design uh, to the same level as we do for alignment A. Um, through the process, uh, these were uh, also, this is a culmination of the, the concerns that we got from December 10th, but they're consistent through all the different public meetings we had. Uh, alignment A, we heard that there was uh, uh, privacy loss, that the trail was too close to homes, uh, using the easement would cause uh, crime, vagrancy, and trespassing, and an overall assumption that the trail would cause reduced property values. Alignment B, uh, similar, except uh, uh, a lot of the comments we got about alignment B were relative to Northside Drive. Uh, Northside Drive has uh, the vehicle speed, they have a high traffic volume, it's a cut through, uh, if, if you go, oops, I'm sorry. If you go this direction on Northside Drive, it actually connects to US 19. And so a lot of people use that as a cut through between US 19 and countryside. Um, so there was a lot of uh, concerns about safety voiced uh, utilizing Northside Drive because of the speed and the volume. Uh, there was concerns about the number of driveways and roads that you cross. Uh, this is a privately owned pond and there was uh, some concerns about uh, people, uh, increased liability, people uh, utilizing the pond. Uh, and there is a potential right near the pond, there's several trees. If you use alignment B, there's a potential to, that uh, some of those trees might not survive the construction. And again, same thing, uh, reduced property values and privacy loss and closeness of the trail to the homes. Um, at the December 10th meeting, what we also looked at was options to mitigate some of the concerns that we had heard previously. 
uh, and uh, we're hoping to get input from the citizens through a survey after the meeting uh, to see if they had any additional ideas that uh, would, would uh, help benefit the trail users and the residents uh, for the two different alignments. Uh, the options that we talked about for alignment A were uh, along Meadowwood Drive, uh, and I apologize, I don't really have a good picture of it, uh, the sidewalk is about 20 feet away from the back of, of some of the condos. Uh, the trail would go on the north side of Meadowwood Drive for about 1,000 feet, and there's a condo complex that basically is the entire frontage of that 1,000 feet. Uh, so our, our question uh, that was put out was, if we put a hedge or a fence or something like that between the the sidewalk and the, the condo units along Meadowwood, would that offset some of those concerns? Uh, there's also the potential, since it's a low volume road, to use what we call uh, share the road markings. You see them right down here. Uh, basically, bicycles have the opportunity and, and, and they can legally go down uh, the streets. Um, but this is a way to make sure that the vehicles realize that uh, that uh, bicycles are, are commonly using that, that uh, lane and that they should watch out and be more cognizant that, that uh, bicycles could be present. Uh, so those were some of the topics that we talked about about alignment A that might mitigate some of the concerns. Alignment B, uh, you can see up here, this is countryside and north side. Uh, the original concept was to uh, cross people across Northside Drive here and then across the, the north side of Countryside Boulevard. Uh, and so it's actually a two-stage crossing that you have to accommodate. Uh, what we did is if you did some kind of intersection uh, modification, you could bring them down the south side straight across and then up. Uh, there was a, a few comments that were received uh, during the, the public input process about uh, if you were going to use alignment B that uh, maybe a traffic signal at this location would be a safer way to do that. I would agree with that, um, that a, a traffic signal would, would help bring that, uh, that crossing uh, to a much safer uh, functioning intersection. And then uh, the last one, which I don't think we got one comment uh, that said it was a, something that they would like to see, and that would be a separate cycle track, which you can see down at the bottom here, which uh, Northside Drive is, is really wide in this area, and you could actually bring a separate cycle track uh, that would separate the, the bicycles from the sidewalk uh, on Northside Drive. So those were some of the things that we talked about. Um, just an overall view of what the survey told us. Uh, the map on the right, you can see that uh, uh, the yellow pins were actually people that were tracked that were uh, that uh, felt uh, alignment A was was the best direction to go, uh, and then uh, the blue pins were alignment B is is would, was their preference. Uh, overall, about 80% of the people uh, were. Uh, in the proposed uh, area of the proposed alignment that answered the survey. Uh, five were commuters, 5% uh, and 15% were trail users. Uh, the alignment preference was basically 55% were, uh, felt alignment A was the safest and, and best way to go and 45% uh, felt that the alignment B was the best way to go. Uh, so, what's our recommendation, I guess, is, uh, is the key here. Um, we believe that uh, alignment A, uh, which was the original alignment, uh, has, uh, has the most safety benefits. It's probably the safest route from, from our perspective. Uh, one of the guiding principles that we've always gone with uh, in, in trying to complete the, the north loop uh, was um, that as much as you can separate the vehicles from the trail users. Uh, the Duke Energy easement does that. It's not the prettiest piece of property. 
uh, but it separates the vehicles from the trail users. Uh, it has less crossings, uh, but and uh, the real significant impact from our perspective with alignment A uh, is the Meadowwood section. It's about a it's about a thousand feet. Uh, it is in close proximity to the condos, uh, so our recommendation would be to go with alignment A, but to work with the Meadowwood Condo Association to determine whether they would uh, uh, prefer a hedge or a fence or some other treatment along Meadowwood Drive uh, that would um, that would help relieve some of the some of the closeness of the homes and and provide a positive separation between the trail and the condos. And then uh, also work with the, the residents on Meadowwood to see if uh, the share of the road markings might be something that uh, would be of, of a preference for them instead of uh, routing everybody down the sidewalk. And with that, I will answer any questions. Commissioner Gerard. And I thought I turned it on. Um, if we were to put a hedge on Meadowwood, who would maintain the hedge? Uh, we would probably go through a contract uh, that would install the hedge and provide maintenance until it's established. Uh, not exactly sure how many years that would be, a year or two. Uh, but we would probably want to pass that over to the Meadowwood Condo Association. And when you talk about share the road, we still have the trail. You're just talking about a separate bike lane on that section. Yes. The, uh, the only benefit to it is it uh, might reduce the number of, of bicyclists on the sidewalk. Uh, the sidewalk is uh, currently four feet, and in that area we would just be expanding it to eight feet. Uh, it doesn't get any closer to the condos. It goes more towards the road, but still eight feet. Uh, it may be better to try and head the, the bicycles uh, in a different direction. It's, it's acceptable to have the eight-foot uh, sidewalk and, and bikes use it, but uh, it's, it's a thought. If, if, if they have a preference, it might reduce the number of people directly on the sidewalk. Mm, might be kind of confusing, though. Um, how long is that section of Meadowwood? It's a thousand feet. That's it. Uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the um, the Meadowwood trail part, um, you so you're you're not expanding the sidewalk towards the resident sidewalk towards the street. That's correct. And when I was there, I mean, it was a significant drop off. So is it a build up or is it a how do you flatten it out to where it's, you know, actually the, the sidewalk would go down and there the berm that exists right there uh, behind the sidewalk right now would actually increase in height. So the sidewalk would would be lower than what it is right now, but it would start in the same spot and move towards the uh, the roadway. OK, and. Um, well, I guess the question then is, I mean, I, when I met with these folks, the, uh, the, obviously they did not support uh, being on Meadowood. So my question would be, if this was the path, I mean, how receptive do you think they're going to be for a fence or a, a, a hedge or something like that? Uh, hopefully that, that I, I mean, I, I understand their concern is, is the closeness of homes. I understand that. I mean, right now the sidewalk exists 20 feet away from their windows right now. Uh, so to me, and, and what I said uh, at the December 10th meeting is uh, the assumption is that there's going to be a, a large increase in the, in the volume of pedestrians using the, the sidewalk. Uh, so uh, from our perspective, to, to separate the, the sidewalk from the, the condos, uh, I, I would hope that they would see that as a as a, a positive way to mitigate that concern. Okay. Anybody else? Um, yeah. Just uh, what, what's the distance on uh, on Northwood Drive? Uh, 
uh, from? I think it's a little la less. I think it's about 800 feet. Okay. Um, did you all look at, uh, and again, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to look at all alternatives right now. Did you all look at the s south side of Meadowood versus the north side? And the reason I'm asking, because when you, it's not only that you are within 20 feet of their homes, you almost, you almost look down into their living rooms. I mean, if you, and I'm, I'm, I'm stretching that a little bit, but you really are high up. So it's a really kind of a, I mean, and I know they're dealing with that a little bit now on a limited basis. Their concerns are with trails in general, not that they su don't support the trails. It's just that, that the number of people that will now come, you know, down in front of them. And they have clearly had the option of putting up walls before um, in their own world. They just have chosen to keep it open. That's their preference. So to your, you know, to the question that Commissioner Justice asked, number one, that's not what they choose to do now. And so, you know, if we make this decision, then they may not have a choice but to, to go down that path. So um, to me, the other side of the road, again, I don't, I'm not even, I, I've been out there three or four times and you've got homes over there too. Correct. So I'm not, it's never ideal. Uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, again, I made the assumption way early on that we had contacted Duke Energy about using that, that trail all the way up to Curlew. I'm now assuming that we've talked to the city of Clearwater about these uh, options on the road. Um, we've, we've spent a lot of time on this. So if we say to you today that we want to go metal on and we want to have a separate road, a separate trail, what you called it a cycle track on the road itself. Share the road um, markings, right. yes. Or share the road markings or a, uh, that, that one in the bottom right hand corner yes. that nobody said that they, nobody said they wanted or didn't want. But um, can we do that? Is that an option? Um, or do we have to say now at this point, no, we have to go to see with the city of Clearwater if that's an option? Or do we know that that's an option? Uh, we've brought all these different alignments to the city of Clearwater and they haven't ever rejected or, or told us that, that any of them were unacceptable. Okay. So how wide is that road and what can, how much room can we accommodate on Meadow Lawn? Well, that would be the, the distinction between a cycle track and, and the share of the road markings is Meadowwood is only 24 feet wide. So uh the the width there probably wouldn't be sufficient to do the cycle track so you would impact the you would have to extend the the curb line either on the north or the south side to accomplish that um, so what we would recommend is is just doing this the the ex widening of the sidewalk and the share of the road markings which basically the bicycles would then you utilize the the roadway itself as that cycle track that you're talking about, uh, but they would be mixed in with vehicles. Uh, but again, the the volume on on that section of Meadowwood is 336 per day, so it's not, you know, what is that? You see five cars an hour, ten cars an hour. And then when we get, let's assume that we did that very option. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the bikes coming off the trail, traveling north, now turn right onto Meadow Lawn and they travel all the way down to Countryside Boulevard. Yes. How do they get, how, how are these accesses to the trail on the east side of Countryside going to occur? They would either have to uh, get off their bikes and walk across the crosswalk that's on the north leg of Countryside and Meadowwood. Uh, the trail actually is being constructed from the north east corner to the north. So they would have to get to the northeast corner. Uh, as a bicyclist, they could go up to the stop sign, make a left turn, uh, and then go into the, uh, up onto the curb to the trail. Or they could uh, walk across the crosswalk and on the north side. Either one is acceptable for them to get across. But to be able to access the RRFB, they would have to get off and go to the, the corner and walk across the crosswalk on the north side. Yeah. Well, right now they can do all the above. I Correct. Mean, uh, uh, they could ride down Countryside Boulevard on the sidewalks either side. They could yes. ride in the streets, take a ride on Northwood and go 
down to the trail. That's correct. Um, so, so we're just what we're trying to do is provide a separate road. It's not so much a, a separate. It's a, a, the the markings, the share of the road markings really just. Are, are as much for the vehicles as they are for the bikes. Uh, just to, uh, to make sure that the vehicles realize that uh, there's bikes in the area, uh, that at some point in time they could, they could uh, uh, that a bike could be present and they need to be aware that that's the case. So they would be going down the, the 24 foot of pavement just like a vehicle would. Uh, I think in the picture you saw on the share of the road there was a bicycle with a vehicle right behind it. Uh, that's that's legal for them to do now. So the marking, really, what that does is it provides emphasis to the drivers that there's a potential for a bike present. Um, but back to your point, the the sidewalk and the roadway, uh, you know, people have the opportunity to do that now. They can go down the sidewalk. They can go down the road. Uh, they can. Uh, intercept that that trail at either end any way they decide to go so we're, we're connecting two trail designs right now um, we're just connected with roads and sidewalks and we're going to yes. make it wider sidewalks yes yeah, yeah. the the one thing I, I forgot to mention and and one of the elements that we felt like uh, was a positive for alignment a was it does, if, if you were to go to alignment B, there would be no, uh, uh, no trail down the easement. And so that would drive all trail traffic down countryside and then on Northside Drive. If you do the alignment A, uh, people that are currently uh, adjacent to Countryside Boulevard can still use Countryside Boulevard uh, sidewalk and still get to the trail a variety of different ways. So it kind of... Uh, uh, expands the network for people to uh, to uh, trail users and and uh, recreational users to get to uh, a place where they can they can uh, ride their bike or or take their walk. So it it, it gives you more opportunity uh, if you, if you do the alignment A. And and then the cost difference between A and B is um, you said about three hundred. It's about three hundred thousand. So some of that would be made up with if 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 we went that metal on route, it would be made up with the some of that difference would be made up with a correct. wall if they choose. That's correct. To build a wall. Yes. Um, um, on their on their property. That is correct, and then the 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 million dollars for the alignment B uh, would not uh, did not contemplate a signal at north side and countryside. So. That would be the other concern or, or a cost impact for an alternative uh, if you decided alignment B. Okay, any other comments? Because we've got a few folks that, um, again, have uh, registered to, to talk to us today, and we'll, we'll hear from some of them, and then we may have you come back up after sure. that. M Mr. Thanks. Chair, uh, Commissioner Seal has raised her hand in the Zoom oh, application. Thank you. So, thank you. Yes. Commissioner Seal. Yes, thank you very much. The, um, thank you, Kat, for recognizing um, and the chairman for allowing me to uh, participate in this way. So um, I also, uh, this used to be my old neighborhood, and but I also have gone out and walked it and driven it um, and talked to folks as well. So two questions that I would have would be on Meadowwood. So Ken, are you suggesting that the current sidewalks would stay as they are, or are you suggesting that we would widen these sidewalks as well as putting markings down for sharing the road? I'm not clear on that. My recommendation would be to go ahead and widen the sidewalk and put the share, to, share the road markings down, but uh, you could leave, if, if you decided to, you could leave the sidewalk alone. Uh, it would still function the same way. Uh, I think. By widening it, you get a brand new sidewalk. Uh, the elevation and the ADA requirements are, are better met because we installed a brand new sidewalk. Okay, and then um, in the price tag for Meadowood, you mentioned putting advanced splashers. Um, 
and a crosswalk of some type across Meadowood, is that cost in the 700000 Yes. Okay. Um, the other thing that I was curious about um, is that, and maybe we talked about this before, but I went and at Curlew and at where the where the drainage pond is. Why didn't we continue along the Duke Energy property? I realized the drainage pond was there, but in walking it, it seemed like there was enough easement to have continued there and then gone north still on the Duke Energy rather than going on Countryside Boulevard, um, continuing north past Curlew Road. The, the, I guess where mm -hmm. we're going is there precedent that was set by going over to Countryside Boulevard and continuing on Countryside Boulevard versus the Duke Energy property. Uh, yeah, I can uh, answer that question. Uh, the, the Duke Energy property north of Meadowood is actually not owned by Duke. It's owned by 16 property owners. Uh, okay. About eight of those are actually uh, part of the Meadowood Condo Association. Um, and then when you get to the uh, pond that you're talking about, it's actually the eight homes that are on the west side of the pond actually own the entire easement. Uh, we, we could, staff could, at some time later, uh, if you proceed with the construction at this point in time, we could probably come back and look to secure those easements uh, and possibly do the segment at a later date as part of another project to take you from Meadowwood up to Curlew and Curlew across to the traffic signal. Uh, but the concern with no. the easements was uh, any one of those 16, if we cannot get the easement for whatever reason, puts a stop to the entire project. Okay, thank you. I, I know you had mentioned that before and I had forgotten that. So thank you for the reminder. And at this point, Countryside Boulevard north of Meadowood is under construction. And then it's marked Cloud north of Curlew. Um, it's actually rather lovely. So um, I don't think that you want to look at that easement any longer. Um, but um, I'll wait to listen to the public before I finally weigh in, but I appreciate answering the questions and recognizing me. Yeah, I think the, you know, I think all of us kind of assumed, and that's why I made the comment in the beginning, that we had contacted the owners along that right away and, and that we were finding opposition to it. I would imagine that metal, uh, the Meadowwood folks would have uh, somehow allowed us to, do, to to use their parts. I'm just guessing. I, not that we've necessarily asked, and you know maybe it then moves off of the right of way, and somehow the you know the, the church participates, um, or whatever. I think that's a church there, or whatever that is yeah. at that that. that facility. But in, in any event, the idea was is that you know we've been trying to get easements out on the beaches from 300 and some odd people that this is only 16. So we, one would have hoped that we would have at least exhausted that as an option. Um, okay, we're going to go and listen to our residents first. And um, uh, we have, I'm, I'm only got one person in the, that's here that I'm seeing that uh, registered and that's Lori Jones. If uh, Lori, you'll come forward and you've got three minutes. Um, to address the commission. Mr. Chair, it appears that Lori Jones is actually on the Zoom call rather than in person. She just raised her oh. hand in the Zoom application. Okay, and the so. note I had was it will uh, attend in person. So I just, Correct. okay. Um, is there anybody here in the room that would like to speak to this? Okay. Then we'll go to those who have registered. All right, Mr. Chair, we do have with um, Ms. Lori Jones, we do have six individuals who have pre-registered to speak on this item. Um, so I'm going to start with Ms. Jones since you did raise your hand. Um, when you're <clears throat> unmuted, if you could state and spell your name for the record and then state your address, you will have three minutes, ma'am. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, this is gonna be a great project and we're, we're looking forward to it. Um, my name is Lori Jones, L-A-U-R-I-E-J-O-N-E-S. 
My address is 2866 Fair Green Drive. Um, and I represent the neighbors on, um, you know, the, the northeast side, which would have been alignment B. Um, and, and through this support um, of receiving, you know, receiving notification from the county just in December, uh, my neighbors and I, you know, handed out over 180 flyers just to the people um, right next to, you know, where where the B alignment would go, and that's even closer to to our homes than than is represented by the the Meadowwood condos. But I also want to just say that I would like to have a you know a true bike path where I can get on my bicycle and and go with the least amount of stops that's really the you know that's really the goal and the safety of the bicycles the safety of the residents with less crossings and less disruption I mean I've, I've actually almost been hit riding my bike down the sidewalk in countryside because people are not looking and people are not aware. And there's actually a lot more congestion that has occurred into our neighborhood now that the US-19 is diverted up north the side to countryside uh, with that new forced right-hand turn by the Yamaha dealership. So we're seeing like really an increased heavy flow on countryside boulevard. So, <clears throat> My neighbors and I are are wondering, you know, when a final decision will be made, um, and you know, we look forward to the support of Alignment A for the the best use of recreational space, uh, you know, for this neighborhood. I'm sure if it would have come up before, uh, the people in the neighborhood would have chosen um, <clears throat> something north of even Countryside Boulevard, eliminating anything, you know, within our neighborhood. We take pride in our neighborhood here and um, we feel very safe and secure. Um, and, and there are some concerns about the public being invited into, you know, our, our private and, and safe neighborhood. But we can, you know, our, our concerns are, are, you know, when will a final decision be made or when will the B countryside, you know, when will alignment B be eliminated from the selection? Um, what would the hours of operation of the park area be, whether it's A or B? Would that still follow dawn to dusk rules? And okay. um, the maintenance of the bike park in the surrounding areas is a, is a big concern. Um, living okay. on... Okay, Lori? Laurie, excuse me. I just wanted to let you know we're we're coming. Your three minutes are up, and I just sure. want to get to the rest of the okay. folks. And you've asked some questions here that we'll try to get you some answers when uh, we come back uh, after listening to uh, the public. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Bye bye. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We do have five remaining speakers. Um, the next speaker, since he's already raised his hand in the Zoom application, is Mr. Scott Bressler. Mr. Bressler, when you are unmuted, if you could state and spell your name for the record and state your address, you will have three minutes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Scott Bressler, S-C-O-T-T. -T. Last name is B as in boy, R-E-S-S-L-E-R. -E -S -S and uh, my address is 3276 Buckhorn Drive, Clearwater, Florida, 33761. I'm in the uh, Forest Lawn neighborhood, if you know where that is. Uh, it's right at the very north edge of where north side and countryside meet. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Eggers and Commissioner, Commissioner Justice and Seals for uh, not only um, visiting with us uh, in the area of concern talking with the residents and taking their time to do so. Very much appreciated. Um, the main concern that uh, I think is, is I have to say, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Jacobs and his department did, did not bring up um, certain things that are, that kind of leave the commissioners in a misled situation, um, to be frank. Um, some of the de the data that I was reading in his presentation, uh, the traffic ratio to volume ratio for alignment B, the roads being crossed in alignment B versus uh, the roads being crossed in alignment A, uh, the major concern should not be the sheer number of accidents 
it should be the concern the the ratio the the uh, ratio of the traffic volume to the accidents uh, there's a greater number of accidents on countryside boulevard but the sheer volume is about 10 times or more so the ratio of accidents to volume is much less by going alignment b or excuse me alignment a in addition Alignment A, it was not brought up with Mr. Jacobs' presentation. Alignment A, you're crossing four throughways that are completely avoided if you use alignment B. Those four throughways that you would have to cross with RRFBs are Northside Drive, Fox Hill Drive, North Ridge Drive, and Meadowwood. And there would be a fifth RRFB needed at Meadowwood and Countryside Boulevard. All five of those RRFBs could be saved and that money could be put towards a sufficient traffic light at Northside and Countryside, it would kill two birds with one stone. That traffic light at Northside and Countryside would not only help the traffic, which also merges at that area, it would solve the traffic issue of the cut through people coming off of 19 northbound, cutting through to avoid the Curlew and 19 intersection that are going eastbound over to Oldsmar and that area. That traffic light would ease that situation. It would also provide a safe, completely safe traffic, or excuse me, trail crossing for the trail users at Countryside because we know we have to cross Countryside at some point. Why not cross at Northside with a sufficient traffic light? Okay, Scott, Scott. Cross at Metwood? Thank you, Scott. I appreciate your calling in. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we do have four remaining speakers. The next speaker is Mr. Bruce Rumble. Mr. Rumble, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone so we can unmute you to speak. Once you are unmuted, please state and spell your name for the record and state your address. You will have three minutes, sir. Hello, uh, I am Bruce Rumble, um, E-R-U-C-E, R-U-M-B-L-E. 2662 Valventos Drive, and I am the president of the Valventos Homeowners Association. And I'm here to address uh, the, um, um, the safety concerns, which uh, really have, are the first and foremost, uh, I, is should be everybody's concern, as I'm sure that you agree with that. Uh, both, um, and, and to go with that, both the, the Pro A and B folks do have an issue already with the traffic speeds on Countryside Boulevard. Now, with that said, if you put a light at Countryside and Northside Drive, that should help calm that down. Okay, so now you can take care of two birds with one stone by putting a light there, which is necessary and needed. Then if you route the trail down Northside Drive to Countryside Boulevard, you'll be going with the traffic. So the traffic uh, safety concerns would not really be an issue like uh, some people are trying to um, report. Um, there would be, you know, you're going along with the, with the traffic. You'll be crossing six streets as opposed to five streets on uh, the A route. So six streets on the B, one of them being a cul-de-sac, it's all about the same thing. The cost is all about the same thing, either direction. It's not possible to put a traffic light at Meadowwood and Countryside because the traffic would back up so far it would be into Curlew. So the only place that you can put a traffic light to safely cross pedestrians is at Northside and Countryside, and that would get them across the street, which is necessary for the, this whole trail route. Um, Countryside Boulevard already has a sidewalk that is basically currently used for a bike trail already. So there's really not much change to the aesthetics and or the, the flow of pedestrians in that area. And that sidewalk actually could be left in place and the bike trail put to the west side of that road, uh, of the sidewalk, that is. 
Um, and one big thing with this is the ability for the police, EMS, and public monitoring to access and, and be safer for less potential crime. If you route it down A, it's in a hidden area. Um, there's not going to be a lot of police patrolling it as much as there would be on Countryside Boulevard. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate your calling in. Mr. Chair, we do have three remaining speakers on the line. The next speaker is a Ms. Kira Barrera. Ms. Barrera, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine, we can unmute you to speak on this item. And Mr. Chair, it does not appear that Ms. Barrera is on the line. Okay. So I'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Anthony, I'm gonna spell your last name, KV. E D A R. Um, if you could please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone so that we can unmute you. Once you're unmuted, sir, if you could state and spell your name for the record and please state your address. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my name is Anthony, uh, but I'll use Tony because it's shorter. So it's T O N Y, and the last name is K V E D A R, Kavidar. I'm at 3390 Thalia Court in Clearwater, Florida, I, and I'm the president of the Chateau Woods Condo Association. Uh, Commissioner Akers, who was kind enough to come visit us earlier, referred, or has, we've not only him, but they've been referred to as the Meadowood Condo, but it's really Chateau Woods. Um, it, the a number of our issues have been covered already, especially the one coming down where it, it, the, the people on, in the Condo Association would have the bike path virtually right under their noses, which we don't feel is fair. Um, and, and using a hedge or a fence to separate us, it, it, it now all of a sudden puts us in more of a kind of like a fortress situation, which we've chosen not to uh, go with, obviously. But the biggest concern I don't think has been brought up yet. And I want to emphasize this. As you come down from the, uh, from the uh, transmission lines down Meadowwood, as you're going uh, east, that uh, we are on the uh, north side, we have an entrance to our condo association right there, which goes through uh, uh, Master's Drive and goes all the way through to Countryside. It's gonna be a perfect avenue for people who don't wanna deal with the issues that you're gonna create here with the bike path. More, more bikes with more cars. They're gonna be wanting to just go right through our neighborhood and it's gonna create a lot of traffic and, and, and which is just not right. Uh, we have a fairly nice, safe, and private neighborhood now, and all of a sudden it's going to be a, become a public uh, thoroughfare. And I just don't think that's correct at all. Uh, I do want to say that, that one of the things that was brought up was the difference in the uh, speed limits, 25 for uh, Meadowood, 35 for Countryside. That's not correct. The, the, as you go by Northside and start going north on Countryside, the speed limit becomes 30 miles an hour. And so that difference is, is not that great. Um, so I just, you know, some of these, uh, the rationale for why we would do uh, alignment A, I don't think hold up as well as, the, uh, as was presented. Uh, and we uh, are very concerned that it's going to take what we have as a, a, a private and comfortable neighborhood to be in, uh, and it's gonna create a lot of new traffic and a lot of new issues that we don't feel is fair to uh, hoist on. Time's not up yet. Anything else, Tony? Well, again, I just want to reemphasize. You've also got some issues on the on uh, on the transmission line, where we know that there are nests of gopher uh, tortoises, and they are an endangered species. So as you go through and start putting the trail there, you're going to have to deal with that. Now, I that you know, and that's going to be an expense that I don't think anyone's taken into consideration. Thank you, thank you, Tony. And Mr. Chair, we do have one remaining speaker. She's coming in from the phone line. It's a Ms. Kathleen Agnew. Ms. Agnew, if you could raise your, or if you could press star nine on your telephone so that we can unmute you to speak on this item. All right, and once you're unmuted, if you could state and spell your name for the record and state your address, you will have three minutes, ma'am. Can you, can you hear me? 
Can yes, you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay. My name is Kathleen Agnew, A-G-N-E-W. I live at 3155 Masters Drive. Um, I and many of my neighbors and members of our HOA are in favor of the initial choice for the loop that is A, uh, the, the route that utilizes the property that Pinellas County and Duke already have available to them down to Meadowood Drive. It's vacant land where there are no cars. Now, the Duke Trail so far developed is monitored and patrolled, I'm told, um, that there have, have been no problems. I don't know that for a fact, but I've been in meetings, um, haven't visualized it myself. If your property backs on that Duke, pro Duke property that's presently vacant and you're concerned, certainly when you purchased your property, you would have checked to see who owned that property and what would become of it in the future. That often is a problem for people. The other route, B, um, has a major problem, I believe, safety. More cars are cutting through and crossing from North Side to Countryside Boulevard. As previously mentioned by someone, um, the county has put, put in a new no right lane, uh, causing more cars to go down North Side Drive. And the stats are showing the volume um, is there and the hazard potential, even with RRFDs, because I've driven through many of those and people drive right through and they never heed it. If a person using the trail was successful crossing at the four lanes uh, uh, where north side and countryside meet, they then have to go down a road um, that is Countryside Boulevard that has limited visibility due to the fact that it's bending and curving. It's not a clear view. And there are six additional junctions that is intersecting streets that the trailers have to survive as well. Yes, there are stop signs, but many of the drivers, sadly, treat those as though they are for others to stop, certainly not them. They are often talking on their phone or some other distraction. As well, think about speed. After the last virtual meeting in December, the next day CPD was out on Countryside Boulevard ticketing, well, speed, picking on uh, people that are speeding. They only cited them. They did not ticket them. Too bad, because a ticket makes you pay attention. Anyway, the trail users um, have those amazing earbuds that block out a great deal of sound. And I'm wondering, are they going to hear those cars coming at them, particularly at those cross streets? Please, please choose the vacant grass area on choice A to save a life. Don't wait until a life is lost or someone is hit by a car. There is property there that Pinellas and Duke own and have available to them where no cars are allowed and therefore the people are enjoying the trail will be safe. We will, and by the way, just as some of the other speakers mentioned about the, the sidewalk already being on Countryside Boulevard, people will still be using that. We're just hoping that you choose a thank you. Thank you so much for allowing us to join your work session. And that's all I have to say. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And Mr. Chair, I do not have any other individuals who have pre-registered to speak, and it does not um, appear that Ms. Barrera has joined us. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Ken? Come on up. Yes, I don't know if you were taking notes of some of the questions. Um, decision making, I'm, uh, I think staff would love to see it. Uh, I think probably the commission gives some direction today, and that's kind of the idea. But maybe you could talk to that and maybe the hours, uh, I think the hours of operation on the trail itself. Well, relative to the decision process, I will leave that to you. <laughs> uh, the trail operating hours, uh, anything that's, that's part of the trail system would be governed by the existing trail hours that, that Parks utilizes. So that would be dawn to dusk. So if you did alignment A, the entire uh, alignment up to Meadow would, would be dawn to dusk. Relative to the trail that's on existing streets, so basically all of alignment B or Meadowwood from uh, the easement to countryside. Uh, since those are public right-of-ways, they can be used 24 hours a day. Uh, they'll still be monitored by uh, parks rangers uh, during the operating hours, but they wouldn't be closed from dawn to dusk like, like the trail is. Um, I had the question about accident ratio. Um, to, to be more specific about the accidents, uh, the accidents, all the accidents on alignment A, which was the five, occurred at Countryside and Meadowood. So 
since since the easement doesn't exist or since the there's no traffic on the easement as it is all five of those accidents would have been in the in the area of, of Meadowwood Drive from the easement to Countryside and I believe the majority of those were at Countryside Boulevard um, so the the ratio is still related to Countryside not so much uh, the the Meadowwood uh, and, and we did, when we looked at accidents, we looked at all the accidents uh, that were along the route. So from, for alignment B, it would have been all the accidents from the easement on Northside Drive over to Countryside Boulevard and all the accidents on Countryside Boulevard all the way up to Meadowwood. Um, but we didn't double count the ones that happened at, at Meadowwood Drive. So, uh, so the 15, I believe, accidents over the past three years on alignment B uh, happened at all those different cross streets that uh, intercept Countryside Boulevard. Uh, and I think there was five at Northside Drive intersection itself. Um, the, the initial plan, uh, I think there's uh, probably some more discussion that needs to be done relative to the uh, RRFB flasher locations. There will be one, uh, if you do alignment A, there will be one on Northside Drive for the crossing across from the south side of Northside Drive to the north side to get to the alignment A easement. Uh, so there'll be one there. And the original plan was to only have another one at Meadowwood Drive for the crossing on the north leg. And that's the one where we proposed that we would add additional flashers north and south of there. Uh, it's very possible that we might do the same thing on Northside Drive. Uh, we recognize that Northside Drive being a cut through is, uh, is a higher speed uh, roadway and we'd wanna take all precautions to make sure that uh, drivers are aware when there's a trail user in that uh, crosswalk. The gopher tortoises, we've heard that. Uh, it is the contractor's responsibility and part of their bid to uh, either relocate gulf, uh, the gopher tortoises or uh, move them to an appropriate uh, 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 location on the property. Uh, that's between uh, the, uh, um, the contractor and, and the permitting agency, which is, I believe, the Florida Wildlife uh, Commission. And I didn't have any others that were specific. Did you have any others that you wanted to ask? Um, I'm looking down through the comments. I don't see <clears throat> any other questions that they had asked. Um, so <clears throat> I think um, the, the meadow lawn uh, for me has been problematic in that we're in people's living rooms almost. And so I've been trying to come up with alternatives along Meadow Lawn, and I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing any uh, really good ones from you all to, that gets them, gets them away from that, that aspect. I mean, I, I, for one, thought we could possibly do something in the road um, and have, a, you know, have that, that, separate, that separate roadway that gets the bicycles comfortably in there so that they're not tempted, so to speak, to stay up on the sidewalk, they, that they actually come down in the street and they're separated from the road, so you give them a, a, a narrow you know, it, it, normally it's four feet. I think we've expanded it to five feet. Maybe you make it 10 feet. Uh, and in any event, we don't have the width. We, yeah, we could look at it, but I would tell you that what would be a complication to that is right now there's parking on both the north and south sides of Meadowwood. And if you wanted to do some kind of, uh, you could do a combination. You could basically do a eight foot sidewalk that takes you out to the uh, the curb and then mark a bike lane for the next five feet. Uh, but what you would have to lose is the parking on the north side of Meadowwood. And I don't know if uh, the residents would be in favor of that either. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yes, Chara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, current, that, that's what was going to be my question was about if the trail basically ended at, came up through the easement and then ended at Meadowwood, and then it was simply on the road that you had the bicycle markings, 
Was that option discussed? Not widening the sidewalks, not but just putting the bike markings on the road so that that was kind of directing you, them towards countryside. You could, you could do that. Uh, I think Commissioner Seal kind of mentioned that. Uh, the only difference is if we don't do anything, uh, and and that's fine with us. Uh, it's basically, <laughs> uh, to me, the biggest the biggest benefit is to get the trail through the easement up to Meadowwood. Um, if you stopped it right there, people would still get to the trail however they got to the trail. Uh, you wouldn't have to do anything on the sidewalk. The benefit to doing anything on the sidewalk is um, we would redo the entire sidewalk. It would be brand new. It would meet all the ADA issues. It would meet all sightline issues relative to Masters Boulevard. If there was uh, an agreement to put up a hedge or uh, some kind of separator, that would be something that we would do uh, as part of the project. If we just terminated the, the, the trail at Meadowwood, technically we wouldn't be doing any of those additional items. And then um, something that I think they mentioned was that, and I don't know which school it is, but there's a school that lets out that people use it as a, a pickup uh, parking lot, basically, along Meadowwood. They park on both sides and wait for school. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, there is a school crossing pickup there. Uh, school crossing. So, the 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 crossing actually already exists on the north leg of the cross uh, of the intersection. Uh, school kids uh, do utilize that to get across uh, countryside to the bus stop, um, but. Uh, the, the concerns that were voiced by, by the citizens were uh, that there's a lot of uh, parents that uh, park in that area waiting for their kids to get off the bus. Uh, we can certainly review that if there's an opportunity to. Uh, we have talked to the school board about relocating the, the, uh, the school drop off there. Uh, they're, they're open to the idea, but uh, again, it's there. There may be a benefit to to having that crosswalk uh, where it's at, and uh, couple that with the trail crossing. I guess the couple of things when I was out there, it just you know, and again, I'm not a traffic engineer, but it just looked like it didn't fit on Meadowwood. It just looked like there was such a small road to put a eight foot sidewalk to to have that trail. And again, it's just to the eye, it didn't look like it fit right. Whereas Countryside Boulevard had the wide vistas of the sidewalk and the grassy areas and the golf course and everything. It just seemed like a much more natural flow uh, using that. And people are already using those sidewalks now for bicycling and walking and everything. When, uh, um, the day I was out, there was a, a gas leak or something, so the traffic was all blocked up everywhere. But um, it just seemed like, a, 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 to the eye, it seems more natural. I guess, in a, um, maybe I wasn't as... as uh, paying attention when we had some of those meetings early on about it, but I really thought that the the easement all the way to um, Curlew had been examined and, and eliminated for another reason, but we haven't even really, I guess that's my disappointment is that we didn't really examine that fully to see if that was an option um, to do use that easement all the way up there. And I know that we've already started construction down countryside, so it, it puts us in a box a little bit that way, so um, that's, that's disappointing that we don't have that that full array of choices, I guess. But um, again, just from the eye, to me, the north side seems to make more sense. Cross to the countryside, put something in there more definitive as far as flashing or, or lights or whatever, and then have the countryside boulevard uh, as the access. But that's, that's just my reaction. I've been out there one time. I don't travel this area very often. I don't see it very often. Um, but from the folks I talked to, that was the preference. Any other questions or comments? Um, yeah, I think I, I think in just intuitively uh, what Commissioner Justice said, it just seems more inviting along Countryside Boulevard because that's just the way it's been for years and years that that pathway down Countryside Boulevard has been used. And there's a lot, there's a quite a bit of distance from the road to the to the go, to the sidewalks. And then even if you bring it towards the sidewalk a little bit, there's just a lot of room to bring it down that way. Um, it just it just seemed to make sense, seems to be a little bit more open pathway um, and then 
um, you know, when we get down to um, north side, um, again, I know we're, we're talking about doing it on the south side of the road, and I, I assumed that we looked at the north side too, but, you know, again, it just seemed like there was, there was more room to do things with there, and then you kind of, the other side, you got the trees right there against it and that kind of thing, so it made it, made it a little, a little uh, cumbersome. But, yeah, I, I mean, I, for me, if you're going to replace the sidewalk on Metal Lawn, then why can't we lower the sidewalk on Metal Lawn and put a retaining wall that kind of holds, you know, where the berms are going into Metal Lawn mm -hmm. so that you lower the whole sidewalk down and widen it, and then it keeps it, you may, it keeps it out of the street, but it also takes it away from being in people's, you know, living room, number one, and number two, leave the option, but set, set some money aside for, for, for a wall or a hedge, whatever they prefer after it's in place and after it's going. Uh, because some of the comments that I've heard, um, and that you clearly understand them, that you're concerned about what the trail is going to do to their neighborhood. They love the trail, most everybody I talk to, but what's it going to do to our neighborhood? And if you go through neighborhoods around the county, and of course my experience is mostly in Dunedin, Palm Harbor, people love it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no more there's no more crime along those trails than there is in a normal neighborhood. I mean, again, I think we have stats that back that up, that if the neighborhood's experiencing this kind, it's not because of the trail, it's just because of the neighborhood. And there, it's very similar throughout that, throughout that area. So there's not really an increase of crime, at least we haven't seen it in Dunedin Palm Harbor. I just think that's just a concern. And I understand it because people do have that change. But boy, when you walk on those trails through Dunedin and Palm Harbor, you are 100 feet from people's homes. Not the back of their fences. Their fence might be 30 feet away, 40 feet away, but their homes are even another yard away from the trail. It's just different. It's, it's not like being right in your living room. And so when you combine the two, the unknown of what's going to happen, the amount of traffic, and I, and I suspect that there'll be people that cross over and go to the south side and walk, if they went metal on, or they'll continue going down Countryside Boulevard and go and connect up, they'll be they'll be using multiple ways. But if we're going to do it on metal lawn, and I don't know what the commission's pr preference is, I think we need to look at lowering that sidewalk um, and, well, and then optioning the the wall if they want it. Okay. Well, we can certainly re reevaluate the design. Uh, I think they were looking at at the original design not to have a a, a huge impact to. Uh, the geometry of the slope as, a, as it is right now. Uh, but if there's a, a preference to lower that to almost make it seem like a separate trail with a bike track with a, with a, uh, a gravity wall behind it, uh, yeah. that could probably certainly be designed, I, just, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> caution, caution on that, too, because I'm just sitting here talking out loud because I, this is not an idea that was floated to me because clearly the idea from that neighborhood was we don't want it here. Yeah. Okay, so they did not suggest that. Um, if we go in that direction and you open up the conversation, that might be something that comes up mm -hmm. and ideas. Uh, that just, it just seems so intrusive there, and they obviously wanted it open for a reason. It just kind of opens their community up. And you put a wall up, it starts to change. Not dramatically, but it's just the way they, you know, again, a community sure. wants to have their, their setup. Um, well, and, and there is different, uh, as an example, on the, on the back side, on the, on the easement side, there is a hedge that, that borders uh, uh, the Chateau Woods uh, condominiums. It's not an eight-foot tall hedge. Right. It's a four-foot tall hedge. Right. Uh, you know, uh, there's there's uh, a lot of flexibility in, in what we think could be done and and uh, where we might be able to get yeah. to a, a reasonable solution that that everybody yeah. prefers. Yeah. Um, I don't. Did did Commissioner Seal checking in with it all? I just want to make sure I'm not missing her. I just raised my hand. She okay. just raised her hand, yes. <laughs> Commissioner Seal, go ahead. I was just listening. Um, so um, if we did north side, I would suggest leaving the sidewalks as they are um, with an option of both because of there's beautiful big trees on both sides. 
um, that I would hate to have destroyed. Um, and the idea of changing the intersection anyway would be very valuable because I believe that that coming from Northside onto Countryside Boulevard, that's an unsafe situation anyway. When I was trying to turn left and go north on Countryside, it was, um, and he really had to be careful. So I guess irregardless of what we're doing, um, I think we should probably address that intersection at Countryside and Northside anyway. You know, another option would be to put um, a crosswalk at Meadowwood Drive anyway because of the school crossing being there or, you know, putting the rectangular beacons in both places. So I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation here trying to decide what is best for both neighborhoods and best for um, the community. When you look to see where people did give their blue pins and the yellow pins, look carefully where people lived. And um, I will say that Meadowwood Drive, I get it. You know, you all <laughs> certainly weighed in. Um, but if you look at the overall community in the yellow, they they kind of um, were looking more at the north side drive alignment for the most part, it looks like. So not an easy solution. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then I, the only, I guess the other question I would ask the commission is, do we have, is there a reason to, you know, if, if, if we're not, if we're get, the ideal would be to give some direction today on the, on the path that we're gonna do. If we're not gonna do that, um, we need to have some specific direction to staff why not and what else they need to be doing to prepare that. So, for instance, if, yeah, we want to consider, regardless of what we've already built, we want to consider the Duke Energy Trail now, then that would be the reason we would delay it and they would go start checking with 16 property owners and see if that's even an option and see whether it could even work. Because, I mean, I don't think probably a lot of work has been done on that option as far as design goes. Um, I'm not suggesting, I'm just saying if, if, if otherwise I would say uh, giving them, giving staff a direction today is probably the right thing to do. So yeah, oh, Commissioner Long, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, I do believe this is our sixth meeting that we have had on this subject matter. And after listening to all of the input, the uh, research and the work that our staff has done, I would be very comfortable moving forward to give the staff direction to go with alignment A and continue working with the neighborhoods as the best you can, knowing that no matter which one we choose, we are not gonna make everyone 100% happy. I dare say once the trail is done, people will absolutely love it. Thank you. Commissioner Flowers. Um, the gradient for the height of the sidewalk area along the residence from Metalon, is it high like that because there were issues with flooding? Um, you know, what made the sidewalk area uh, give rise to be built so high versus, because typically, um, sidewalk areas abutting the backside of person's property is lower. Mm -hmm. So is there like flooding issues or were there flooding issues or concerns? It was probably just the height difference between where the properties are and the street and there's how, how do you connect the two and it was either have a higher sidewalk on the I don't know I'll let I'll let the engineer yeah. speak. But, I'm just asking because you had yeah. a good suggestion about lowering um, so that persons wouldn't be looking right into their homes, yeah. but it would be lower, so their fences would be yeah. um, high, such that you wouldn't see all the people driving. But I, I think the commissioner is correct, or the chairman's correct. Um, it's more uh, they they put the sidewalk in and then had to tie it to the existing backyards for the condo complex. Uh, you can do that either by uh, slope or. Uh, with grass on it, or you could do it with some kind of gravity wall, and they just used a slope or a berm behind the sidewalk. 
Uh, as far as I know, we haven't ever heard of any flooding problems, but uh, that's in the city of Clearwater, so I'm not positive if, if there ever was any. But most likely it was, it was just how it was engineered to, to meet together. And my last question is, you stated how many traffic incidents for either one, were those all vehicular accidents or were they vehicular and pedestrian? Uh, actually, I think there was out of the 20, and I'm sorry, I don't have the data with me right now, there was uh, two or three bike accidents, uh, and those were all along Countryside Boulevard. Thank you. Commissioner Gerard. So, <clears throat> do you know how far along are we on the segment between Meadowwood and Curlew on north side, around Countryside Boulevard? Uh, it's, it's currently under construction, and it's been cleared. I know that from Curlew, probably halfway down uh, has been constructed, and that's a concrete section, so it's, it's, it's pretty far along. Uh, okay. You know, if, if at some point in time uh, there, was, there was interest in going up the easement and, and we went back and, and tried to get that as a, a future project, I don't think the countryside segment would be a throwaway. It's still a valuable uh, access to a lot of those uh, residents to be able to use that uh, in a similar fashion to people can go down countryside right now if they want to, but if, if alignment A was built, they'd have a choice between the two. Hmm. Uh, if you connected Meadowwood at some point in time later to Curlew, I, you'd have the same opportunities. Well, I'd love to see if we could get the easement through there. I mean, um, I like option A into right up to that point. <laughs> and, I, and I believe, as Commissioner Long said, that once the trail is in, people are going to love it. And I suspect that there's going to be a fair amount of traffic down foot and bicycle traffic down Meadowwood, whether we put the trail there or not, just to get to the trail. So you know, more than there is now, because right now there is no trail there. And so we don't know what the traffic would be. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. Uh, Commissioner Long did make a motion for A. Oh, I thought she did. Well, that was my Sorry that, about that. That was my intent, so I don't know that we're voting today. We were asked to make a recommendation, and my recommendation would be that we go with alignment A, um, with maybe a hedge or something at Meadowwood. Uh, those that seems to be the choice that most of our citizens like the best. So, for me, I mean, I I can't remember another issue that has come before us that we've had six meetings and six public opportunities to weigh in. At some point, we have to make a decision because the staff has been working diligently and dollars have already been expended. So that's my point. Thank you. That was fine. I just didn't hear a motion. I, I thought I had, so I apologize. Don't worry. We're good. So we do have a motion for a... No, we don't. We oh, have a recommendation. We have a right to it. Never mind. <laughs> Does anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, well, the same. I would like to see option A, but also with the idea of checking on that um, easement going north. Barry, you look like you're. you're no, okay. I, we we need a. It's a. It's a. Yeah, recommend, recommendation. It's not a formal vote. It, staff has the ability to implement, but um, we wanted because of, of the public um, participation in this, we wanted the commission to weigh in. But they were already. Except, except for this section. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. Go with that's fine. okay. Any thoughts over here? Okay. Well, I need to, you know, get everybody's options here. So I mean, I'm, it, since we didn't have a motion, and we, you know, yes. Uh, well, I, I still, again, just looking at it and talking to the residents, I still feel more comfortable with option B. But, you know. That's where my comfort level is. 
unless 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 Steph goes back out and talks to the folks there and they find some more comfort level with the hedge or with the alignment or something like that. It's kind of hard to have these negotiations at this level. Yeah. Well, what if we did this? Well, what if we did that? And and so, you know, I don't know how much of those conversations have happened with, with the folks out there and not. Well, I know we've been out there a long time with our staff, but um, that that's where I'm at a comfort level. Um, yeah. If we have a vote, we have a vote, but yeah. that's what I'm. Uh, and I think, I think the alignment preference there that they're showing if you know of course the blue pins there's a lot of folks on the meadow lawn and they have concerns uh if you you know give, again i'm not it's important to hear from them and i think it's really important that we satisfy their if it's coming your way how do we satisfy all of your concerns and i mean so it's just about how do we get there once we've made that decision because clearly if we could make them more comfortable with that path, the predominance of other people prefer going that way. They prefer going down Meadow Lawn, if you look at all the other folks, aside from the Meadow Lawn folks. But yet they live there, so I think we have to really be cognizant of what their issues are and really try to address them. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Peters, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and and I can I, I agree with um, Commissioner Long and and your comments about metal lawn. Um, my concern about um, B is I think it was the fourth slide, and it's the it's the traffic comparisons. It's how many the the traffic volume is significantly different if you go on Countryside Boulevard. The number of crashes on Countryside Boulevard is significantly higher. The number of street crossing is is higher. Um, I, I'm worried about the safety of, of people on not just the pedestrians and the bicyclists, but the drivers as well. So, so my concern is the safety issue. If you take Countryside Boulevard, I definitely agree we should work with that metal on metal, you know, wood community, and try and come up with some kind of solutions to help them be more comfortable with it. But I, I, I'm just too worried about the, the fatalities that could result if we go on Countryside Boulevard. Ken, could you come just real, real quick? Um, and it is uh, Commissioner Seal Wing. I just want to make sure I'm not missing Commissioner Seal. So she has not raised okay. her hand. Okay. Um, Ken, if if we would go um, A and we do the the protections to get across the road, we check obviously with you know. Um, so we get, give directions at that point. You come across Countryside Boulevard, and you could stay on this side of the sidewalk, and go down and have an I don't know if we're going to have an RFFB to get across to the heading south on the trail, or you could cross here and go down the south side of the sidewalk um, or, or the street. You go on both sides. I mean, it, it, they're there. There's sidewalks on both sides, um, and then you put the bicycle suggestion in the street. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of tries to basically dilute the traffic from going everybody out of the one on one Mr. side of the sidewalk. Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We have lost the Zoom um, feed oh. right now, so we're gonna we're working to get it okay. back up. Okay. And we'll we'll make sure before we do anything formally. I just wanted to I just yep. wanted to let you know. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner, uh, we, we really do need to wait to make sure that that Zoom feed comes back on so the members of the public can see the discussions. So if we can take okay. just a minute here. Okay, well, I don't know if it's going to be a couple minutes or if it's going to be right away, so. Is it going to be a few minutes? Yes. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll take a, uh, a five-minute uh, five break.
first said we were going to come back at 12.15. I don't know where that came from. I, I just asked for five minutes. We're now back. We're going to continue the discussion. Uh, I've heard from a few, three or three commissioners that uh, talk about going along alignment A and co obviously closely working with the, the, the meadow, uh, wood, uh, the community there that's named, it's not meadow lawn. Meadow Woods. It's not Meadow Wood. It is Ch Chateau. Chateau Woods. Yeah, Chateau Woods. Um, but I've heard from three. So I want to make sure we have at least a fourth commissioner that wants to go in that direction uh, so that we can be clear about when we leave this meeting, we are going to go down that alignment A or alignment B, and the staff will be moving forward in that direction. So I need uh, to hear from another commissioner or two. Um, Karen? Yes, yeah, she's back on. Okay. Or I don't. she asking to speak or no? She has not raised okay. her hand. Oh, now she has. <laughs> okay. Uh, Commissioner Seal, um, we've, we've heard from three commissioners that prefer alignment A um, with close work with Chateau Woods. So just wanted to hear your thoughts. I guess I can live with it. I honestly think alignment B is um, better if they worked the intersection um, and created a crossing there. Irregardless, I think if we alignment A or alignment B, as I've said, we need to put some kind of crosswalk that has some rectangular beacons because Northside right now is not a safe situation, as I mentioned. Um, trying to drive and turn left there um, with different alternatives, but I guess just because Northside Drive is wider, I, I thought geez, you could leave the existing sidewalks, you could add a bike path or share the share the um, street signage as you're suggesting at Meadowwood, but um, that's that's my thought process yeah. at the present. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I did talk to Barry in, at the break and we were talking about if we, if we did end up going with alignment A that we could still look at doing something at with city of clearwater obviously this is their streets not ours but working right. with them to provide some safety mechanisms down at Northside drive on the south side of it so that if folks because there will be <laughs> as, as you know ken you were saying if we have the alignment a chosen there'll be people that go alignment a there'll be people that go down countryside and cross over on alignment b correct they'll be going both ways so it would be i think up to us to make sure that we mark all of the crossings along Countryside Boulevard that go into homes that just clearly say, this is a, this, just clearly mark it. This isn't the trail, but it's, you know, and then uh, do something at Northside. But, you know, I just think that's something that we need to offer to the city that we would, we would do as a way to improve the safety at that intersection, because we're gonna have people going that way. Um, okay, so I heard Commissioner Seal, any, any other, comments here i heard i think charlie you voiced uh with uh, your preference on b commissioner flowers did you have uh a... I, I would prefer a which is why i asked the questions about um, the sidewalk the sidewalks the pedestrian safety okay. how many pedestrian accidents because i know that's been a problem throughout the county okay. yeah thank you uh, i i, I kind of share commissioner seals feeling about b but uh, you know it, but, but if i can live with a we've got four commissioners that are telling you uh a so we're going to apparently give that direction to staff to move in that in that direction, but at the same time, work extremely closely with the, the neighbors along that route, and then see what we can do with the city of Clearwater for any road sharing, any you know like a bicycle path or whatever we're going to do. Work closely with the city of Clearwater to do what we need to do on uh, on Meadow Lawn. Metalwood. Thanks, uh, Commissioner. That's that's really what we need. We can, you know, now that we have an alignment to A, we can then work with the neighborhood around, you know, the, the specific details regarding what we do up in, yeah. you know, along Metalwood. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. Um, but before we end and let Ken get out of here, um, I did want to take the time to recognize Ken for, as you know, he's going to be retiring after 31 years of service. Um, you know, Ken has been instrumental in our uh, countywide intelligent transportation system, passing the ninth cent gas tax. Uh, Pinellas is, a, I mean, really a nationally recognized leader in the ITS system. 
Um, him and his staff has acquired over $100 million in, uh, in federal, state, and local grants. And we just wanted to wish Ken um, all the best in, in on the next stage in his career with a, a local um, you know, firm. Uh, so we, uh, we wanted to you know, threaten the other firm and you know, cut them off, but <laughs> we, we, we didn't do that. Um, but we, uh, we do wish him the best, you know, and uh, just wanted to take this time to recognize all all his good work and wishing Godspeed ahead. Yeah, he, he, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, you know, can I give you a, a few minutes? Uh, but he truly is an incredible professional. But he has a demeanor that is so good for public interactions too, because it's not easy being out in the public and being even keeled in presentations and in response to questions. Um, always been f friendly, um, very helpful to me personally when I've got questions. I just can't thank you enough for all that you've done for Pinellas County residents and for us and for, for, for our office as well. So, again, best wishes. Thank you very much. Um, to you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Seal has raised yeah, her hand. Yeah, Commissioner Seal, go ahead. Thank you. Well, Ken, it's been a pleasure. Um, you have been the leader and the glue as we went through putting ATMS, ITS into place, using the gas tax to make all these projects, going after so many different grants, working with the different cities. Oh my gosh, um, you've had a lot on your plate. You made my traffic control traffic signal control center a reality. And there's been lots of um, progress made due to all of your efforts as well as the staff um, that you work with as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I hate to see you go, um, but you leave behind quite a legacy. Thank you very much. Uh, just, uh, you know, this isn't just me. Uh, I have a great team behind me, uh, work with uh, consummate professionals. Most of them have been with the county for a long, long time, uh, and uh, you know we've we've managed to build some things. The the commission has been so supportive of everything that we've tried to do. Um, the approval of the night set is uh, honestly what probably sets uh, Pinellas County uh, uh, way ahead of of most other jurisdictions and. The commission was uh, put that in place, dedicated it to a specific mission, uh, and I think it's paid off. Uh, just so you know, uh, for the most part, any time that we went out for a project, we could use that ninth cent as a local match, and we've always been able to match that with an equal amount of grants, either from the state or some other entity, uh, federal or state. So that has paid off pretty much double of, of what the original estimate for that revenue source was gonna be, so. Uh, and that was all the commission that, uh, that did that, and uh, I appreciate Karen Seal uh, driving transportation to uh, uh, a new level when she first came on. She was, uh, took on US-19 and a couple other major projects and, and uh, made transportation something that we needed to talk about, so yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, again, thank you. And I know the next phase of your life will be equally busy. So yes. uh, good luck with that as well. Um, any other comments before we, well, uh, again, best wishes, my friend. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. And Tom Have Washburn will be the interim uh, transportation division director. Okay, good, excellent. And now we had a note up on the board a minute ago that we will be taking a break until 1215 and we can put that note back up because we will take a break until 1215 and we'll start back then. Thank you.
um, our second item. But just before we do that, I wanted to um, just make a comment about the first item. We had a, a five-minute technical glitch. The screen said we'd be back at 12.15. In truth, we came back five, seven minutes later and had the discussion and gave direction to staff to move forward with uh, alignment A. I just want to make sure if anybody was not with us when we made that direction to staff that they hear that. Um, as well, <clears throat> we said that uh, the staff is now directed to work closely with the neighborhood along Meadow Wood Drive um, to make sure that we take into account all of their concerns and their preferences uh, as to how to make Meadow Wood uh, more tolerable uh, for them. Um, and we also uh, said that we would like to see some um, discussion with the city of Clearwater about doing something down at Northwood Drive um, and uh, Countryside Boulevard to make a safer crossing down there. So uh, those were the two things. That it, did I miss anything? I want to make sure. Okay. All righty. With that said, we'll go ahead and get started with our second item, which is environmental and, and recreation land acquisition process. And uh, Mr. Burton. So um, as you re requested, we've um, prepared a brief presentation regarding the um, acquisition, the environmental lands acquisition process. And Paul Kazi is here to uh, walk you through the process that was created, um, the um, challenges that we have in, uh, in trying to um, make good choices. Um, and then we'll you know, open it up for a discussion and answer any questions. So I'll just turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Um, thank you, County Commission Chairman, Commissioners. Um, I'm going to get started talking about specifically why do we acquire properties. Um, you know, first and foremost, we look at environmental preservation purposes. Um, this is a heavily built out county, so if there are opportunities to make intrinsic environmental acquisitions, um, we're interested in those. But we also look to provide recreation and regional park opportunities. Um, the way that we've traditionally acquired a piece of property is that, um, you know, we recognize or we're aware of a parcel and then or a seller approaches the county and then we make a, a determination just like that. Um, work with REM or real estate management and then decide to either uh, purchase or decline on a parcel. So before we talk about a new process, I just want to briefly go through just what our history of land acquisitions has been over the past uh, Penny period, starting with Penny One from 1990 to 1999. Uh, the county acquired approximately 2,500 acres uh, at a cost of roughly $48 million. Um, and you can see on the map to your right of the screen, um, it's the location of where these acquisitions were made. And there's also a little heat map there uh, relative to the size of the acquisitions that those were, where those were made. Um, the notable parcels, just to mention, you may be familiar with, of course, Eagle Lake Park, um, Florida Botanical Gardens, and a lot of acres up in the Brooker Creek Preserve. Chairman? Yes. Just, th I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, this is, I think, really interesting information for our residents. I think so many folks think that we've owned these properties forever and don't realize that it's not that long ago that the county was taking these actions. I mean, I've been here my, my whole life. I didn't realize that some of these were this recent in the acquisition. So I think this is really, really neat information. Thank you. So going to the second penny, which covers the period from 2000 to 2009, the county acquired approximately 700 acres at a cost of $58 million. And once again, you'll see the location of the parcels and the relative comparative size size on the map, but um, the notable acquisitions, Wall Springs Park, Coastal Editions 1, 2, 3, and 4, Mariner's Point Management Area, as well as the Homestead portion of Eagle Lake Park. Going on to the third penny, this is kind of interesting. Uh, we acquired almost 900 acres 
at the cost of $22 million. However, all of the funds were actually expended in 2008. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that's because we had an opportunity with the Eldridge Wild Parcel, which, which is approximately 885 acres of that uh, land, as well as the um, collaborated with the city of Dunedin for the purchase of the Weaver Park parcels. So just a quick note that we advanced those funds and then paid ourselves back once the new penny kicked in. So that takes us to 2020. Um, and, and we're in a position where we haven't purchased any parcels up till 2020 when we acquired the Bay Point properties that are really um, part of a joint park stormwater project. But for environmental and recreational lands, we've proposed in the current penny $15 million. Um, you know, there are multiple parcels that have already been identified, um, and that comprise over 300 acres, and just the just market value, which I can tell you is far away from what the actual sales price is going to be or would be, is in excess of $35 million. Now, one of the things I would want to mention when we talk about parcels that we're looking at or things like that, you know, we need to be careful not to read too much into that. You know, we get approached by people. We've been compiling lists for 20 plus years between what used to be the Department of Environmental Management as well as what was parks and, and recreation. So um, there are a number of parcels that are shown here. And, and what this is is kind of a heat map um, that once again kind of gives you an idea of the location of parcels that we're aware of. Doesn't mean these are things we necessarily have to buy, um, but they are certainly things that are worth looking at. So I mentioned before, um, you know, the, the process we used previously was pretty straightforward. We had money, um, we looked at parcels. If we thought it was um, uh, worth acquiring, we acquired it. There wasn't really any system in place to, ter to determine the overall value to the park system or the environmental land system. So we, need, we knew we needed a new approach. So back in 2018, we established a working group of many departments to try to help us um, really establish criteria that would be able to be evaluated objectively so that we could kind of winnow through the, the number of parcels that we've looked at previously or that were being brought to us um, even more recently. So we went through this opportunity to prioritize or to be able to prioritize um, our real estate, potential real estate acquisitions. So as I said, it was an evaluation process that we put in place. And as you look on the tables that we have above the blue table, every parcel we look at gets evaluated under these criteria. Uh, things like access to water, um, what funding available, availability there may be through grants or FCT or you know what's in the penny. Uh, we look at cost per acre, what are the operating and maintenance impacts going to be? What's the total acreage of the parcel? You know, um, we're more of a regional park system. We're not really looking at trying to pick up a couple acres here and there. It doesn't really add a whole lot of value um, unless it's an adjoining parcel to an existing uh, preserve or regional park or community park. So on the environmental parcels, we also rank all of the parcels for environmental purposes, which means they get extra points, um, you know, depending on the lack of exotic or unde undesirable species. Um, if it's in a floodplain or provides some type of resiliency. And when we look at or score a parcel for park and recreation purposes, so that would be regional parks, community parks, sports complexes, those types of things. Uh, one of the things that we prioritize is the proximity to underserved communities. Um, 
So each one of those criteria are scored. And one of the things that is interesting about our, our mechanism is that some of those criteria may have inverse scoring relationships. For instance, if you're looking at something um, for recreation purposes, um, and it's got species protection and biological diversity, it's probably not the best place to put a sports field. However, it may be something that you want to preserve. Um, so you might acquire it for environmental purposes, either preserve or management area. So there are several of those things. So the, the scoring on a piece of property, there's going to be two scores. There's going to be an environmental score and a park, and, park or recreation score. And I just kind of explained that right there. Um, but so we call it the A score and the B score. The A score is environmental. The B score is park or recreational. And then we have what I, we call our average score or the AB score. So what that looks like is kind of like this uh, when, when uh, we've completed our work. Um, you have a parcel, it's been scored, it comes up with three separate scores. If you look at the purple, uh, and if we're looking at these across the table, we'd say parcel H is highly desirable for environmental purposes. Um, parcel Q is highly desirable for environmental purposes. Uh, D and B might be the highest prior or highest ranking for recreational purposes. And then you've got three parcels that rank uh, very highly in both areas and provide you the option and versatility. Most likely those parcels are going to be your larger parcels because they, they allow for different types of activities. So now the, the, the acquisition process we're going through now um, we go through the evaluation process. Uh, that's something we do with other departments. Um, we prioritize the parcels. We request real estate to perform some preliminary analysis, which generally is done now through a, a third party. And then we also look at what the potential funding opportunities are through that. We turn it over to real estate. They take the, do the due diligence for us and then it moves on to the Board of County Commissioners to make the final decision, in a nutshell. So, challenges. Uh, of course, especially right now, uh, you know, I'm sure you get emails and, and phone calls uh, about why aren't we acquiring this and, and those types of things. Um, we're in a time again where properties are being snatched up pretty quickly. Um, so certainly being agile um, is, a, is a real challenge. We think we've addressed that by engaging a real estate broker. Um, you know, the cost of the potential acquisitions that we'd like to have far exceed the money that we have available. Um, and then we also have to look at, well, if we do acquire properties, they have to be maintained. So there's going to be an operational uh, and capital expenditure associated with that. And then we also have to look at, we've got multiple opportunities. There may be some parcels that will address similar opportunities. So when we talk about a list of properties, whether it's 60, 70, 100, um, that doesn't mean there's 100 properties that we really need. There may be 10 properties that serve the same purpose as each other, so it's just a matter of potentially acquiring one property. One of the things we also have to keep in mind is we get contacted or real estate gets contacted probably monthly with opportunities for acquisition. Um, you know, and this list is always going to be subject to change. You know, we've, we've done due, due diligence on several parcels already this year um, that were either acquired by someone else um, or we just weren't able uh, to meet the, the um, asking price for a parcel. We also have to look at the 
parcel scoring reflects a comparative value. Um, you know, it's not meant to say, you know, that this is the one you need to have first or second. I kind of refer to it as it's not really a scoring, um, but really it's kind of a stacking of what, what should we be looking at. It all depends on location. It all depends on what else is in the area. Um, there's a lot of factors. It depends on the appraisals that come in. Depends on whether or not we have a seller who's interested to sell. So to wrap it up, you know, prioritizations from our scoring process, our evaluation process, is dependent on balancing the needs, the availability, the cost, location, and the purpose for the acquisition. So just to go through the time frame we've been under, what we've been doing, um, you know, we do have finalized proposed or finalized scoring criteria. Uh, we have looked at a number of properties. Uh, the criteria that we use was reviewed by our Parks Advisory Board. Um, we formally implemented our evaluation procedures. We've done a complete analysis of all the properties that we have been made aware of over the years. Um, we also, and, and this is something that really is something available for staff to use, uh, working with the GIS folks, we have a mapping process where we can identify a parcel and get a lot of the information that we're looking for just by clicking on it based on the criteria we've established. And then we've also engaged the consultant to determine to perform the due diligence and to be able to directly approach parcel owners. So, um, and at the time I wrote this, this box wasn't checked, but we talk about initi initiating acquisitions, which we are, of course, uh, working with the sun city of Dunedin and hope to be able to have that checked off fairly quickly. So with that, if there's any questions or comments. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any land in Dunedin that we haven't bought yet? Because, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, when, when a, a parcel is presented to you and you, you evaluate it for preservation and recreation, and you look at it and you go, well, this doesn't really fit either of those, but it might fit housing or economic development. Is that, how is that shuffled off to another department or how is that kind of through the evaluation yeah. process? And that's a great question. That, that is one of the things because um, we want to look at every parcel to see if there's a potential, you know, whether it's a co-use or someone has a primary use and we might be someone who might be able to get the secondary use out of it. So we send those parcels around to each department, uh, you know, the major land departments, real estate, public works, utilities, uh, economic development, housing, and say, do you have a do you have a use for this property? Because if we can identify a, pro a parcel that has multiple uses, it actually scores higher as well. And well, that's good to hear. Um, and then the the uh, again for the preservation or recreation, it, have you looked at? It, and I don't know if it's come up through the process or you get a parcel and you this is really scores high, but the long term maintenance costs are are just going to be so much that it, it's more of a deterrent for us purchasing. Well, and that's that's something that we we do look at, and it is something that, especially when we're looking at environmental parcels, um, you know, if we're looking at a parcel and it's going to cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to get rid of Brazilian pepper, um, you know, the the environmental value is kind of lacking because it's it's really been an altered piece of property, and, and the ability to exterminate that or keep that out of there is a years, years, years long process. So that gets into that whole thing about what, what are the O&M costs for holding this property? Okay. And then um, the last question is back to the, the budgeting. Um, and it, it kind of, to that we budgeted 15 million for this penny, uh, when in previous pennies we were at 22 million, 57 million, 48 million, um, kind of highlights certainly highlights the gap there, especially if the 10 to 19 penny, the 22 million, we really spent in the 08 penny, which is, so we spent 79 or 70, you know, somewhere in there in that penny for these acquisitions. And I know that some of it's timing and obviously, yeah. Yeah. 
but it, it, it just kind of highlights yep. where um, we're lacking in this penny as far as projecting out how much we could have spent, I guess, with the so, land cost going up. So, we, so the 2008 uh, purchases, we advance the funds, and then when the, pen, the new penny come in for penny three, they replace those funds. So that's how, that's how those acquisitions were accomplished. But you're right, it's $15 million, um, and you, you saw the list. Um, uh, just a couple things to add on that, because you know we can take the Douglas property as an example. Um, one, we worked with the city to have them acquire the property, and they're going to maintain that. We're going to take care of preservation, the preservation piece where we have the expertise. That's that's one of the benefits of that partnership, uh, is to be able to accomplish that. Um, but the big thing was the looking at the cost per acre. One of the problems that we have is when we say we're going to purchase something, then you know the price tag goes up and and people believe that then you know at the, because of the public pressure being placed upon you that we're going to purchase it at any cost well the reality is that from a scoring standpoint that drives the ranking down um and so we have and and unfortunately we have to make those types of choices because if we spend too much on one we could have gotten three other priorities done within the limited funds that we have in the Douglas property, in this particular case, the community stepped forward because we had a piece of property that was valued at five and a half million at its current zoning. The multi-million dollar question was, would a rezoning be approved? Well, that's going that decision drives the land value, and so the only way to do that is to go through a year and a half process to determine the outcome of that. The community stepped forward and provided that that gap funding to be able to make that project happen. But that's going to be the case in, in, in a lot of these situations. Um, and that's the difficulty we have in trying to uh, address a fair and reasonable amount of trying to balance the competing needs. Um, and, and that'll always be a fluid situation. Commissioner Long? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, at the risk of, I'm glad Jules not here, but Don is. <laughs> We know we're going to be uh, dealing with the tides issue here. I don't know exactly when. But my, my question is, to me, when if we're really serious about resiliency and sustainability and climate change and sea level rise, that piece of property fills the need for many different things that we say we're concerned about our shoreline, uh, the stormwater management opportunities on that property because of flooding, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that it butts right up to Millennial Park, I never understood why that wasn't just all one gigantic. Can, can I ask a question? And let me interrupt case. just one second. I'm sorry. Uh, do we have, is this, a, is this item on the docket? Uh, it, for this, being considered. this item will be, be coming before you um, from a um, rezoning request. Standpoint. Okay, I just want to make so sure I that would, we watch. I would advise, I'll, I'll defer to the county attorney's office, but I'd advise we not talk about specifics regarding that piece of property. Yeah, I just want to be careful. Uh, Don, did you have any? Um... As I understand it, it will be coming forward, so it probably would be advisable to limit what kind of conversations you would have about this, especially hypotheticals, uh, as opposed to any kind of real um, purposeful attempts to talk about anything directly. So generic comments are fine, but specific property comments we need to stay away from, uh, especially one that's in the queue. Well, you, you're talking about something separate and apart from the tides is the topic of your discussion. This has yeah. kind of come up as a tangent. Right. right. And I might Understand. suggest you keep it Understand. kind of... So I'll be generic. Yeah, thank Mr. you. Chair. So um, it, a piece of property like that, for instance, that has the potential, we even had some com conversations way, way back when with the folks that were concerned about, about the Baynet Point golf course, that you do have the option because of the size of taking care of all the environmental issues that I just referenced but at the same time, taking another big section of it and keeping it to a smaller, maybe a nine hole golf course or something like that that could be used for recreation. But at the same time, 
wouldn't we be able to charge uh, a fee for people that wanted to play there and then that fee could cover the cost of maintenance? I'm uh, just curious. Well, well, yeah, I, I would say that goes beyond where we look at things <coughs> at the you moment. Talked about, you talked about maintenance and cost of operation. Sure, but, but not from the standpoint of a business plan of acquiring oh. a piece of property and then how would we pay for it? I think, you know, to answer your question, certainly there are things that if you're going to talk <coughs> about what's important, all of the things you mentioned are important when we evaluate a piece of property and, and the template we use uh, directly addresses questions like that. But it adds but, to the scoring criteria as well, right? If it right. meets all those. It's, it's, part of, it's part of that scoring criteria. But Commissioner Long, to your point, um, those, those challenges, let's take um, an expansion of an existing park into other areas beyond its existence. So you're trying to balance that. That would be a good thing. From an operations and maintenance standpoint, it's probably easier to do that than create a new park, right? At the same time, we're balancing that with the fact that we need more recreation and open space over in Ridgecrest or in High Point and areas where they don't have the same opportunities um, and they don't have parks. And so, so those are some of the challenges we have, but we don't even know if that opportunity is going to be available for us in those areas. Is, is there a piece of property for sale? That's that's the reason this is a guide, um, you know, more than than a you know a, a, a specific business plan because you got to balance those those two competing needs. Commissioner Gerard. Well, and to answer your question, there's a reason why golf courses are going under why they're being closed at this point. It's very difficult to make a go of them these days um, because the maintenance is so high. Um, but I, uh, on the other hand, I don't think we can assume that every golf course is going to become available for purchase, you know, and or any or every parcel that's on here is going to come on the market at a time when we're ready to buy it. So, I mean, that's that's another factor that like you were saying, that mm -hmm. plays in, and whether we want to do active recreation or not, which I don't. Another, another <laughs> so, conversation. And certainly not a golf course, because I dealt with that one in Largo. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, the other thing that I was thinking about as we have these conversations, um, I'm thinking about um, the, the sales pitch that we put together uh, with our, you know, I call it sales pitch, but it's really our marketing approach to the Penny Four. When we talked to our residents about what we were going to do, and I think we've had some emails that challenged uh, that we're sticking to those promises. So I think to be able to go back and see what we talked about would be helpful. I think the benchmarking conversation about how we, I, and you sent some information on mm -hmm. that I'd like to talk about in a bit, how we stack up. So I don't want people to say that we're in a concrete jungle here. We've got lots of parks and we've got lots of open space. Now, some people may say it's not enough and others will say it's too much. And, you know, you can sure. have that discussion, but at least having a feel for kind of what we said we were going to do, uh, also what we're doing as compared to others. Um, and then have the discussion, and we've had it before many times already, is the competing interests for affordable housing, recreation, light industrial, you know, all of those different kinds of lands that we need, uh, and environmental lands and stormwater, uh, like we're doing with uh, Bay, Point. Bay Point. Thank you. So, so there's a lot of competing interests here, and those kind of conversations are fluid, they're dynamic, but we just need to make sure that we're all aware of, of all of those pieces. But I would just like to maybe have some time to talk about that, what we told our residents we were going to be doing from this perspective, and then some benchmarking conversation. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to ask is the, uh, the ranking system um, was A, like it was recreation, environmental, like you combine it and you rank it. But I thought there was a ranking also that included score, uh, you know, dollars. That goes into, that's a factor with Right, that's, the, that's one of the factors. But it, we've not developed a ranking system. All the ranking systems we have have been a blend of recreation and environmental, or we develop a... There's a separate recreation, there's a separate environmental, and then there's combined. the combined score as well. But not, not with respect to cost. Well, 
cost is included with each within each one of them. Oh, as right. you rank them. Correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I just want clarification on that. Yeah, starting, you know, like zero to thirty thousand dollars an acre, okay. maybe worth ten points. You get up to two hundred thousand dollars an acre, it might be worth zero points yeah. when you're evaluating. Yeah, clearly right now, I think that you brought it up in this one example that we're dealing with right now, you have a partner, but you also have a private partner at the right. table. And we certainly are not proposing anything more than the appraised value. So uh, we aren't. Government right. funds I'm talking about. Right. The, when you add the private piece, it goes above that. So I think those are things that we have to think about as well. And I know you're having that conversation later, later today. Yeah. And so. Well, and, and in, in those particular cases, somebody says, well, I'm going to, you know, rezone this piece of property. Well, okay, but it's not zoned there today. And so the public's going to say, don't let it go through, don't take that chance that, you know, grab the piece of property. Well, we're challenged with trying to guess what the future use would be, you know, and that which dictates the value. That's land use and or zoning. Correct. It could be either one. Correct. And, yeah. and, and it gets more complicated if it has to come before you in terms of um, our ability to discuss and even talk about a future use. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're complicated. You know, there's, there's several factors that we have to uh, play, you know, when we're trying to look at that. We also recognize there may be areas where this is just a critical piece of property and we would be willing to pay more because there's no recreation in that area or something like that it's compared to others where there's other opportunities yeah. and it's so we'll, we'll evaluate these what we've done is we've we've tried to put some objective criteria and this is at your direction but objective criteria around it to where it can we can, it can inform our discussion and ultimate decision yeah. um, you know but it's a it's a work in progress and, and something to consider in totality all the different competing is, issues yeah. to try to make a final decision yeah, I mean, if this was if we were a private owner somewhere wanting to buy a piece of property, it would be very quiet, hush hush. We can't do anything that way. I mean, it's just the nature of being in public service. We have to. Everything is transparent, and even with re, and even with respect to inquiries, can become public knowledge, and then the seller understands our role in it. And we're trying to be careful about that. And so when I'm talking about being, you know, careful with how you speak publicly it's more about trying to protect the public's interest with those with the many sellers that are out there trying to maximize their return because we're involved and, it's very and, tricky and it's I want to I want to speak to that because <laughs> you know we had this issue with Bay Point when we were when it was the county um, the price went up okay now you know we waited that out and <laughs> and we we took aggressive steps to make sure that um, they were uh, proper um, owners of land, um, but they tried to extract more because they knew we wanted it. Okay? And, and so that's the tricky part about putting pressure back on us is then you can fleece the taxpayers for more money, you know, if we fall for that. Yeah. And, and that's the, that's the challenge. It is, it is, it is a difficult, complicated flu as commissioner Gerard said, it moves all the time. You know, timing is a very important piece to this whole thing and availability. And, you know, there's a number of factors, but I do think, having a systematic way of looking at gives us at least a chance for kind of a baseline conversation. Um, any um, other questions? Um, could we talk, do we, can, or can we talk a little bit about the questions that I asked or are we not prepared to talk about that today? Um, what we, what we said to our residents kind of as a, Oh, uh, okay. Bill, Bill Berger, might Bill be Berger. To, okay. Uh, I was just curious, kind of putting a putting it in context of. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, so there were a couple of questions I think you posed. So uh, maybe we could take each one. So mm -hmm. if you want to uh, start with the first one, and then we can go through each one. Mm -hmm. That's all right. It's fine. Um, well, the first one was um, when we were talking to our residents about Penny Four. We talked about. Um, environmental lands and we talked I think we had like categories of what we might be spending our their monies on a lot of it was infrastructure and you know all that but did, was there a piece in there that we um, that, that there was a commitment made uh, 
I remember something about by acreage, like so many acres of land that we would pursue, but I, I just wanted to see if we had any information on that. Um, I would have to look back at the materials. I do not believe that we put a specific acreage on there. Um, we might have had a target goal in mind of what we might be able to accomplish, but because of the nature of each property being so much different and the value of the property not being directly associated with the acreage, um, I doubt that we would have had a specific target okay. number that I, was I don't listed. remember. I, I know there was a financial amount that we put together in the materials. So if you recall, there's uh, the you know, one document that we like to reference all the time, which is about a five-page document. It's still on our Penny website. And that details what our intended and you know, high-level uh, goals were for how we're going to distribute the funds. And that's where the 15 million for environmental lands over Penny Four came from. Okay, was from that document. Okay, so that was kind of what we used going into the to the uh, 2017 referendum. Yes, and that's that's what you all approved. Okay, was that list? Okay, that's, that that's important, I think, because again, we've been having folks that that call us and challenge what we're doing based on what we promised, and I just want to make sure that. First of all, it's only year one, <laughs> so so to say that we didn't do anything in the penny is, I mean, we're nine years to go here. So, uh, but just trying to make sure we understand that baseline uh, commitment that we, again, it's not going to ever be to the dollar, <laughs> but at least a sense of the direction that we're going. So, and, and I think that uh, the comment you just made about it being only year one is very important for us all to remember as we go through the next ten years, and we did make it a point on literally at the top of every single page of that document that you all adopted as far as what our priorities were to say that this is subject to change each year based on the changing needs and wants and desires of the community because a 10-year period is really mm -hmm. a lifetime from a budgetary perspective yeah. uh, from a lot of perspective from a lot of different ways um, if you remember from penny three that not no sooner than did we adopt penny three we went through the Great Recession and had to cut the program by 25%. Um, that's a you know, major change yeah. in how we had to adapt and adjust, and even our strategic plan at the time had to radically change as a result of changing priorities because of what the Great Recession did to our community. Yeah. And we had, so, a, we had a little bump the first year here. So I was going to say, and, and, our, and this year right it now. seems like you know, deja yeah. vu all over again with the pandemic hit. <laughs> So, and how that's going to affect all of our priorities, too. So, yeah. I, yeah. What we said, I'm looking at the um, actual document. It, it says uh, targeted 250 acres of um, acquisition. Okay. Um, it has $64 million targeted. A lot of that is replacement, existing park structures, boardwalks, um, infrastructure, um, park roads, um, Wall Springs uh, park expansion uh, improvements, um, visitor center, heritage village. Um, and then targeted 250 acres. Got it. That's all. That's yeah, all. Yeah, that's and that, and that gives just a sense of what the goal might be. Right? Correct. I mean, so and a lot of those were current infra current parks and the infrastructures within those parks, dollars to improve. Yeah. And, and I think that's an important point also is that there is a distinction that we have in that list between our properties that we own now and that we're planning on improving and the properties that we don't yet have that we are hoping to be able to acquire and preserve moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Any questions for Bill while he's here? I like your mustache, by the way. It's, it, Thank it's you. coming in really well. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? Okay, thanks, Bill. Thank you. And then, Paul, if we could talk a little bit about your, your put, you put together a, 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 a sheet here talked about um, Peer County comparisons um, and kind of it talks to what Pinellas County has in green space acreage. And maybe first we could just define what that is, really. I don't even know what, when you say green space, are we talking about environmental lands? Are we talking about open space like parks and um, recreation parks? Are we talking about golf courses? What's in that green space acreage that? The dedicated public green space is land that's been set aside for parks, environmental purposes. Um, it can be public golf courses. Um, you know, all of those areas would, would be considered public green space. So, um, you know, we look at it, and, and one of the ways that we, we get this 
these numbers is you look at what's zoned as recreation, open space, or preservation resource management, and then you gotta fi figure out who owns it, who's, who's managing it to make sure you're not talking about commercial properties. Yeah. So when you look at these, I, and you picked three, four, five, six, seven, it looks like eight counties to look at, right? Yes. Um, and when you add up the county maintained and then municipal, it, you've, you've made an effort to understand what Seminole and Largo and have set aside for the same yes. types of land. That was an exercise and a half. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. I wish I, I, I wish I lived in Hillsborough County, and I only had to worry about two cities. <laughs> <laughs> True. So, and then state maintained. Yes. Um, green space, um, and so the so a percent of the county maintained is green space. You're saying with all of those add-ins, we're at about fifteen percent. Yes. Of, of of the acreage of Pinellas. Of the county. acreage in Pinellas County. Of course, then you got all the rights of ways and the roads and right. all that. That's a different number. Different, but yep. yeah. Um, so we, it's, if you took those numbers and added it on, they're just talking about the amount of land that's available for anything else, really, um, mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a different number. So Hillsborough County's at 16, and they're all kind of, I mean, Seminoles, uh, Seminole County, Sarasota County, up around 20%, somewhere lower. Um, and I don't know what the average is of these when you do the, the actual numbers and such, but sounds like it, we're kind of in the middle. Uh, I mean, I yeah, just, yeah. Uh, you know, and... and and it goes to the other one where you just looked at county managed parks and conservation lands. Uh, you know, the county's in the top third uh, when you look at how we compare amongst 67 different counties. Um, you know, one of the things, of course, we just looked, uh, and this was borrowed from, from uh, the Florida Outdoor Recreation Inventory maintained by the state uh, lands. Um, you know, we don't have state forests, so, you know, you can go into uh, Marion County, and of course, they're going to be, you know, from just the total number of acres perspective, right? they're going to beat us by a mile. But when you look at what the county has set aside, you know, I think we're right up there in the top 20 as far as number of acres per 1,000 people. So we looked at it two ways number of acres per thousand residents, number of acres um, as a percentage of total land mass. And I, I will have to say, you know, that does change and sometimes changes rapidly. Um, Hillsborough County has a very aggressive uh, environmental lands acquisition program. They've got a lot more land that's available to acquire. Sarasota and um, uh, I believe Manatee County uh, recently have passed um, uh, acquisition uh, a amendments. Dedicated, to, dedicated millage? Or yes, either sales tax or, or um, property tax. For environmental land. For environmental purchase. lands acquisition. Yeah, but I think to your point, when you look at the sizes of these counties, uh, Seminole counties even larger than us, but we don't, it's not like we have Right. You know, uh, Hillsborough County, 652,000 acres compared to our 174, for example. I mean, it's a, it's a, yeah, big, it's a, big, it's, a big difference, and you can do more with that. Uh, um, any questions on any of the um, – yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Gerard. We used to be five times more dense than any other county in the, in the state. Is that still true that you know of? I don't know I of that. I, I think one of the things you always have to keep in mind, and, and of course, being aware of, of that oft repeated thing, you know, when you look at, say, a Broward County where everyone is within, you know, maybe one fifth uh, of, of the county from, right. from the Atlantic coast, you know, you're looking at people are comparing, well, this is so much denser here, but that's because very few people live in the middle of the Everglades. Right. Um, it's so. not like we have any <laughs> rural areas at all. Right. We've pretty much covered every place we can yeah. here with the exception of Brooker Creek Preserve, which is <laughs> right. our little Everglades. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Any other <clears throat> questions? Um, 
So I guess just getting a sense of, of what we have available, where we kind of stack up, um, what we've told our residents we're going to do. Competing interests are there every day, very brings us opportunities to participate with um, affordable housing. I mean, we've there have been parcels that we've um, either given at a very low price or given so that we can build some affordable housing on. And I'm assuming those areas too, uh, Barry, if they're large enough, we, we look at those infill parks as an option instead of housing options. So again, you're, you're balancing bringing some recreation, again, albeit smaller parks, infill parks. Um, so we're always balancing those, those interests in some of these communities that you've talked about that have no recreational land. I think it'll be a very good discussion when we start talking about our role in recreation. Yeah. Um, because you know, I you know, and I, we haven't had to make that choice yet, but we're the first year into the penny, yeah. um, and we're going to have to make some of those choices. But certainly, um, we've got to have a balance there to address uh, underserved areas. Yeah. So just from what I've heard today, I haven't heard anybody really voice opposition to the direction that we're going uh, the way we've started down that path you know in terms of ranking and how we our thought process to it and I mean unless I hear anything differently I guess that's a, a process that will con you know continue and continue bringing opportunities to us when when they arise uh, it, Commissioner seal have any is she waving or she has not raised her okay. hand. All right, so but, uh, Mr. Yes. Chair, I just wanted to say I think it's a great system for letting us take a look at these parcels, but also letting the community know what we're doing and how we're rating these parcels because they may think it's a great piece of land that has zero value for us or not very much value. Yeah. So and in this county, helpful. in this county, with it being kind of a redevelopment county, it, um, prices are higher. Yes. So when we look at pieces of land that we, you know, there's a there's always a, an amount above an appraised price that people want to charge. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is, whether you're selling your home or, and so we, we, you know, we, we've made a really strong effort, at least government has to pay appraised price. You might tweak it just a little bit above, but not much. So invariably we're going to be looking for partnerships to make some of these acquisitions happen in some cases, because the price clearly is way above what you would, have a professional appraiser appraise that price at. So one of the reasons I think it was good to kind of put out the different criteria is because every time there's a developer that wants to develop a piece of property, the neighbors want us to purchase it. Um, they do. All right. Even if it doesn't have an environmental benefit, doesn't have water access, doesn't have, you know, and that's the challenge. Yeah. We can't purchase those, all those, you know, and so it has to fit the other environmental categories for it to rank high. And, and, and that's just to be considered, not necessarily to take action on. We just, the timing may not pr allow for it. So, but if we don't have those criteria, then, uh, I mean, like you said, every piece of property becomes a candidate and they can't do that. Um, anything else before we move on? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, Barry will go okay. right into the Once agenda the, briefing. Um, agenda? Yep. So we have a, a couple of um, public hearings. Item number four on, the, on your agenda is uh, from the city of Tarpon Springs. This is a change, a piece of par property from uh, low medium to public, semi-public. This is actually where Tarpon Springs City Hall is and a performing arts center. This is just to bring it in conformity with the countywide plan. Item number five is a map amendment, um, again in Tarpon Springs to, from resort to low, um, to residential low medium on 8.6 acres. Um, and again, this was, they were, uh, the neighborhood was made aware, so the resort um, asked for this amendment. It's to bring the property into its conforming use. So the association initiated the amendment because it's inconsistent with our map. And we'll have the local state of emergency. We have um, items from the clerk of the circuit court, reports for receiving filing, um, miscellaneous items received and filing. Item number 12 
is an award of a bid to Suncoast Development um, for a project on 49th Street and 38th Street. 38th um, Avenue. Excuse me? Avenue. Oh, Avenue, yes. Um, project did includes intersection improvements, road construction, turn lanes, $1.1 million. County Attorney. Uh, we have given a notice of a new lawsuit in defense uh, in uh, the case that's noted there. It's an a allegations of negligence resulting in personal injuries. Item 14 is a resolution granting um, status to um, Florida Digital Amateur Radio Network. Uh, this is to where they can receive donated surplus property. Item 15 is honorary and philanthropic naming rights policy. So you have several requests before you so this will be for your discussion and consideration and we're just going to be talking policy not necessarily the specific requests um, or are we? you have you have three items on here what you choose to do with those is okay, up to fine. you fine. so fine. a couple of different paths you can go That's down um, I've talked to each one of you about those okay. you can ask me any questions between now and then okay Commissioner Long did you yeah I have I have a question about 15 and my question is I, I read the pol our policy thoroughly, and do we have to send it to a committee? Well, it's your policy, so you could choose to waive your policy. Um, right. It's so not my, my recommendation. Is, if we had agreement, all of us, on one of the three uh, asks that we've received, then we can send the other two to a committee? Do we have to send all three to a committee? You, I'm just no, asking. You can, you can take take any three of them and do with them in whatever manner you choose. <laughs> Not to, you, you, could, you can send it to a committee. Um, you could uh, waive your policy and act on it, or you could um, defer it and set up a committee. Um, so we could take this is this this is going to be some general discussion and maybe some specific discussion. It's, um, it's where, yeah. wherever okay. you want to take that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, my, no, the how does the committee who puts the committee in place? Well, the way your policy states is that if you have a um, committee in place for that particular area, for instance, a park, well, that you should it doesn't say, it says you should use that committee. So. In a park, you would send it to your parks advisory committee. Um, if you don't have a committee, then you would need to form that committee for that sole purpose. And we, we form that? You, you would form that. You could direct me to form that, you know, work with you, however, however you want to do that. Okay. Anything else on that one? Okay. okay. 